Muy buenos días, eh, bienvenidas, bienvenidos a la Casa de América. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the House of the Americas for this event, Transatlantic Relations in a Time of Geopolitical Tensions, Public Opinion in a Shifting Global Order Ahead of the 2024 Elections. Um, dear Ambassador of the United States of America, and dear friend Yulisa Reynoso, always welcome to Casa de America. President of the GMF, uh, Heather Conley, and all her team, especially Christina Kausch, uh, Deputy Managing Director, and who has worked so much for this event to take place. Welcome to Casa de America. Um, dear Manuel Muñiz, Provost of the IE University, former Deputy Foreign Minister of Spain. Um, I would like to welcome also um, Ricardo López Aranda, uh, Spanish Ambassador to Ukraine. Welcome, dear Ricardo. Uh, the Ambassador of Brazil, uh, who's also with us this morning. Members of the Diplomatic Corps of the Foreign Ministry, dear friends, uh, students of the IE University. Welcome all to the Casa de América, La Casa de América, the House of the Americas. It's, it's, it is a pleasure for us to kick start our political and international relations program of this, of this year, 2024, with an event devoted to the transatlantic, transatlantic relations. I would like to thank the German Marshall Fund. Fund, of course, we all know this very prestigious US think tank that seeks to promote further cooperation and understanding between, between the US and Europe. Um, and Casa de America and the GMF share uh, those objectives of strengthening the relations, in our case, between the Americas as a whole, from Canada to Tierra de Fuego, and Spain and Europe. Both entities, Casa de America and the German Marshall Fund, organize activities seeking through a plurality of voices and views, open discussions, exchange of ideas, that better understanding of both sides of the Atlantic, thus promoting those relations and making them more robust. Um, as probably many of you know, Casa America is a public consortium created by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the region of Madrid, La Comunidad de Madrid, and the Madrid City Council, aiming and strengthening the ties between Spain and the American continent with a special focus on Latin America and the Caribbean, but also on the US. Casa de America was founded in 1992, 20 years later than the GMF, I think. Uh, and since then, we, Casa de America, have been committed to that idea that Spain and Europe and the Americas are stronger together, just like the GMF has been doing, in this case, with the, the US and Europe. During these 32 years, three, de three decades and a little bit more, we, Casa de America, have been working as a platform to share ideas, knowledge and experiences from Spain, Europe and the Americas, always with the principles of democracy, human rights and international cooperation as highlights of our activities. I am sure that you all here believe in those principles and are aware that much is to be gained in Spain and Europe and the US and the Americas if we all work within that framework. I think the, the events this past, this last weekend in Guatemala are proof of that. And without further ado, I believe that this event and many more that Casa de America will be hosting this 2024 will add to that better understanding between both sides of the Atlantic that we all look for. Thank you very much. Welcome to Casa de America. We now welcome Julissa Reynoso, the US ambassador to Spain and Andorra on stage. All right, so good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone here today. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you to Casa de America for being our partner and host this, this event. It's really a great honor for me to be here and to uh, welcome the German Marshall Fund officially here in Spain. 
I know this conference, uh, the first ever event uh, of this nature here in Madrid, is just the beginning of a robust uh, presence in Spain that will advance our shared vision uh, of the world, a vision based on a democratic, secure, and proper, prosperous world in which freedom and individual dignity prevail. I know a little something about being uh, the new kid in town. Um, two years ago, I arrived here in Spain to serve the people of the United States and President Biden as the, as the ambassador to Spain and Andorra. And just a few weeks later, uh, Russia began a war of aggression in Ukraine that is the most immediate and acute threat to the international order and values the transatlantic alliance has fought to enshrine since the Second World War. The transatlantic alliance is being put to the test, as you will no doubt only learn today. But the United States has stepped up to meet the challenge. Spain has stepped up to meet the challenge. And Europe has done so as well, collectively. Not only the nations, the governments, but the people of these countries and, uh, have uh, committed to protecting and advancing these shared values, as we have seen from the tremendous commitment, both in terms of resources, but also humanitarian uh, connection that has been put forth by the people of these countries, and the, the welcoming nature of uh, Europe and the United States of Ukrainian refugees. A coalition of more than 50 countries is confronting these challenges head on here in Europe and the support and defense of Ukraine. Now, almost two years later, Ukraine is still with us and Russia's invasion is strategic failure by almost every measure. And for the last two years, we've stood together as an alliance to fiercely defend the values that define us as democratic, as democratic nations. And as you will hear repeatedly today, 2024, this fantastic, remarkable year of good fortune, I hope, will be an unprecedented year in the exercise of democracy. Over 60 countries, the EU, uh, and half the world's uh, population will go to the polls, including my, the citizens of my country, which, as you know, uh, in case you didn't notice, will go to uh, we'll have an election this year uh, in November. It is the biggest election year in history. The decisions made this year will have a profound impact on the future of transatlantic relations and, on, frankly, our domestic um, cohesion. None of us know what the future will hold, but today, through um, GMF's 2023 Transatlantic Trends Survey, uh, which was conducted across 14 countries, I hope we will gain a more comprehensive and detailed understanding of the perspectives that will shape our shared future. It is really a delight to be able to understand um, in detail what people are thinking and what people care about. Hopefully that will let us be better at what we do, uh, be that public servants like myself or regular leaders in different spheres in the private sector, government and the like. I want to thank Heather, Beth, uh, Manuel, and of course, Cristina, the main soldier here in Spain for GMF for sharing uh, their thoughts with us on what their perspectives mean for the transatlantic relationship in such a, a critical year. I'm looking forward to a robust um, dialogue, a robust uh, conversation, an informative discussion. And again, I want to thank you all for inviting me and allowing me and my team at the embassy to be part of this important initiative, and we really look forward to more of these uh, here in Spain, uh, given our tremendous um, and important relationship and the critical value that Spain brings to the table in all these discussions. Thank you very much. Presenting the 2023 Transatlantic Trans Survey is Martin Quences, Managing Director of GMF Risk and Strategy. Thank you, thank you, buenos dias, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Martin Quincey. I'm the Man Managing Director for Risk and Strategy at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, very happy to be here this morning to present some of the results 
of uh, one of GMF's flagship uh, research uh, projects called the Transatlantic Trends. In a way of introduction, the results will help us maybe guide the policy discussion that we will have with the panelists afterwards. So the Transatlantic Trends is um, a public survey conducted by the German Marshall Fund uh, with the support of the BBVA Foundation, uh, FLAD in Portugal, as well as the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, as it was said previously, it covers 14 countries on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, the US and Canada in America, 10 EU countries, among which uh, Spain, and the UK and Turkey. Uh, in the 2023 editions, we have 26 questions. We cover a great range of geopolitical issues from the war in Ukraine to Taiwan, issues to do with the state of democracy in our countries, uh, NATO or the state of the transatlantic relationship. But for the sake of this presentation, I want to focus on three main takeaways. One, that when we ask population on both sides of the Atlantic, we realize that a big share of the public expects a shift in the balance of power in the next five years, with the end of the US supremacy to the benefit of China. The second takeaway is that when we look at the results, there is no really east-west divide in Europe with regards to Russia and Ukraine. The, the idea that geography defines how you see the conflict is not really confirmed by the data. And you will see that the perception in Europe uh, on Ukraine and Russia is much more complex than this. And the third takeaway, perhaps I believe one of the most interesting ones in the 2023 edition, is that there are very significant generational gaps in our perception of the world and I would say quite surprising ones, with younger respondents much more likely to have a positive opinion of Russia and China than older respondents. So let's get to it. First, on the global influence and the shift coming between 2023 and 2028. So we asked uh, the public, who do you think is the most influential actor in the world today? If you see on the left, Almost two-thirds of all respondents today believe that the U.S. is the most influential actor, 64%. The EU comes second with 17%, China third with 14%. Now we ask, who do you think will be the most influential actor in the next five years? And there you see a very different picture. Down from 64 to 37%, 27 points uh, decrease for the U.S., and China coming second with 30% of all respondents believing that China will be the most influential actor in the world. The EU from six, 17 to 14% and, and Russia from, from 5 to 7, more or less stable considering the margin of error. So clearly you see here that China more than double its uh, share of the population that believes that Beijing will be the top actor, the top country uh, in the next five years. And it's quite remarkable given the time that we're looking at, only five years for this shift to take place. Now, if we look at it more in details, you see that in 2023, there are obviously differences, right, between the 14, among the 14 countries that we're looking at. 87% of Americans believe that the US is today the leading power, down to 57% of Italians, so 30 points different here. Uh, interestingly, in the US, this is one of the issues where we don't see much of a partisan divide. Republicans and Democrats more or less see that issue the same way. Um, you can see, though, that already in 2023, a fourth of all Italians and a fifth of Dutch or Romanian already believe that China is leading in international affairs. So we, we have already quite a significant share of the population on this side of the Atlantic who sees China as the most influential actor. Now, in 2028, we see a decrease of 30 points almost everywhere. Now, the US obviously, starting from 87%, going down to 59%, still a majority of Americans believe that in five years, 
the US will be the leading power. In Italy, more than 50% of all respondents think that China will be the most influential actor. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, and that is a question for the policy debate afterwards, what does it mean if the public believes that they live in a world where China is the most influential actor? What kind of trade-offs is the public ready to make? And the whole debate around um, the coupling, the, ris the risking comes to mind here. If you think that China is now more powerful, more influential than the US in international affairs, Looking at the, the Spanish results, you can see that it's close to the average here, with 60, um, 61% in 2023, here 32% in 2028, believing that the US is the most influential actor. But you have more, I wouldn't say support, they have a bigger share of Spaniards thinking that China will lead uh, world affairs in 2028 than Spaniards thinking that the US will still be the leading actor. So there is clearly a shift in Spain as well. Now, obviously, it, it, it doesn't mean that it's good news for a lot of these respondents. And I, and I would say that we were wondering, does it come from some sort of anti-Americanism? Not really. When we asked the respondents, how do you feel about the US role in the world, the action of the, um, of the United States or the action of China, you see that a clear majority of all respondents, 58%, have a positive opinion of the US action in the world, the US influence today. Exact opposite in the Chinese case. With it is pre-Gaza. It, pre it is during the summer. Um, 57% of all respondents have a negative opinion of the Chinese influence in the world. There again, you have differences. You can see that a country like Romania or Turkey is much more likely to say, well, actually, we are sort of hesitant or divided on whether China is a positive or a negative actor in world affairs. In the case of Sweden, Germany, there is not much of a debate. Clearly, the population has a very negative opinion of what Beijing is doing in, in international affairs. So I think we need to take that in mind also for the policy discussion when we think about what Europeans will be ready to do with the US on their own China policy. Let's move to the next takeaway. Since February 2022, we've, we've heard um, that Maybe one explanation for why European countries do not behave the same way with regards to Russia and, and Ukraine is simply that they have a different geography and they have a different perception of the Russian threat. Obviously, geography matters, culture, history. But what we see in the results here is that it's much more complex than simply saying the closer you are to the Russian border, the more aware you are of that threat and therefore the more supportive you may be of Ukraine. Now let's look at how people feel about Russian influence. If you look at the bottom uh, countries, you will see that the countries that are the most critical with regards to what Russia is doing in the world are Portugal, Sweden and the Netherlands. Portugal is a remarkable country in, in this uh, survey as in almost all questions we realize that the Portuguese are more critical of Russia than the Poles or the Lithuanians. They are more supportive of NATO and more supportive of US engagement in European security than Polish or, or Lithuanian respondents, something that perhaps uh, will, will be more rationally explained here in Spain than, say, in France and in other countries, but it was something that surprised us. On the contrary, at the top, countries that are perhaps less critical, although you will find that all 14 countries we've surveyed, a majority of the respondents are quite critical of, of Russia. You will find Turkey, Romania and Italy. This is not quite the sort of east-west divide that you could have expected that way. Similarly on Ukraine, I'm afraid it's a bit small here on the screen, but I'll explain this. We asked the population about three policy options with regards to Ukraine. Do you support Ukraine entering NATO? 
Do you support Ukraine entering the EU? And do you support financial aid to the re reconstruction of Ukraine? Now, the countries that are more to the left are the most supportive of those policy options. There again, you will find Portugal as the leading country to support Ukraine and support Ukraine in NATO, in the EU, and the financial aid to the reconstruction. You will find, perhaps less surprisingly, Lithuania and Poland as number two and three, and quickly after the UK and Canada. I think something that's interesting here is that although Spain is sort of average in the, in the graph, you have a clear majority of Spaniards that supports all three policy options, from about 60% uh, on, on the NATO membership to 74% on the financial aid to Ukraine. So clearly, maybe the idea of a sort of fatigue uh, on the conflict should be you know, framed in, in, in a different context. There's still a strong majority that supports the, these options. Now, this sort of corresponds as well to the policy situation on the ground. If you think about the countries that are the most problematic ones with regards to our policy towards Ukraine and Russia, you may think of Hungary, Slovakia, Turkey, not countries that are to the west of the continent. So I, I just wanted to share that, and perhaps happy to have also the, the opinions of the, the, the panelists afterwards, how we should frame and how we should have this narrative around east-west in Europe in the context of the, the war in Ukraine. Let's move to the last takeaway, generational gaps. As I said at the beginning, um, it, it was a big surprise, frankly, for all of us working on this survey to realize that in almost all 14 countries considered, younger respondents have a more positive opinion of Russia and China than older respondents. And what surprised us the most was the intensity of the gap. We're talking about 25 to 30 points difference. This is one of the biggest, actually, differences uh, in the whole survey. As I said, it covers all 14 countries, but I want to show four countries more specifically here. Germany, 37% of Germans between 18 and 24 year olds believe that Russia has a positive influence in the world. We are in the summer 2023, a year and a half approximately after the beginning of the Russian invasion. More than a third of young Germans believe that. Now, 7% of Germans who are over 55 agree with this. In the US, 30% of young Americans between 18 and, uh, and 24 also think that Russia has a positive influence in the world. Less than 5% of older Americans share that opinion. This is true as well of China. You will find that in the UK, over 35% of all respondents between 18 and 24 think that China is a positive actor, a positive force in global affairs. This is 6% of older British respondents. In Spain, you will find that older respondents are much more likely than in other countries to also think that China has a positive uh, action, positive influence, 22%. But still, double that number if you look at younger Spaniards, 45% of young Spanish, 18 to 24, have a positive opinion of China's uh, role in the world. Now, we've had many debates, I mean, doing these briefings with uh, different you know, ministries and, and experts around Europe and in, in the US. Why is that? I've heard different opinions, different views. Perhaps the information bubble, where you get your information and, and the role of social media, TikTok, play the role. Perhaps also the formatting years. And if you grew up at a time, perhaps during the Cold War, you have a different view of what U.S. influence in the world is about than if you grew up, say, during the Iraq War or during the Trump presidency. And finally, there might also be just a general relativism among younger respondents, which is that they don't necessarily see China and Russia as very positive, but they see them just as bad as the United States or Europeans, which may be even scarier. But I'm, I'm very much looking forward to what the, the panelists may have to say about this. 
I would just add that this is also something we notice on other questions. On NATO, younger respondents are much less likely to think that NATO is important or that NATO protects them than older respondents. On the role of the US in global affairs, younger respondents will be much more critical than older respondents in all countries. I think the only one that is an exception here is Turkey, where you see that actually all the respondents, the older Turkish respondents, will be more critical uh, of the US and NATO than their younger compatriots. Let's just finish with a few thoughts more specific uh, about Spain. Something that is quite striking about Spanish results in 2023 is that Spain is one of the countries that believes the most that the EU protects their security interests and one of the very rare countries where they think that the EU will become more powerful and influential in the next five years. As I saw at the beginning, the EU average was 17% uh, in 2023, believed that the EU was the leading power, 14% in 2028. Spain, it is the reverse. We see an increase and a more confidence uh, towards EU's uh, power and influence. And finally, because I think that perhaps the, the, the debate will also uh, touch upon the question of Taiwan. We had a question on what do you think your country should do in the scenario of, uh, of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? Now, Spain is, is quite average here uh, with the other European countries and to a certain extent even with the US in supporting a diplomatic effort, even a quarter of Spaniards in, in support for sanctions, but very wary of any sort of military involvement. And I'm not even talking about sending troops, but sending weapons or um, supporting Taiwan militarily in any way only gathers 5% of support in Spain. I'll stop here. A um, few questions for the panel. I'm sure, Christina, you, you will pick up some of them. Um, but very happy to, to take questions also during the Q&A if there's anything that you'd like me to detail more. Thank you. Muy buenos días a todos. Muchas gracias por venir en ese día tan lluvioso. Uh, good morning, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for making it here in such a rainy day, which I know we all know in Madrid means a lot. <laughs> so um, before I, if you allow me, before I turn to the panel, I would like to share with all of you my joy and satisfaction that the German Marshall Fund now has a presence in Madrid. And uh, so I get to chair this stellar panel and hopefully many other similar events in the future. So, all of you. 2024, um, when years turn, um, superlatives and cliches usually abound. Um, but this year it feels there's no exaggeration, none of them is overstated. Um, 2024 does feel like a poor, perfect storm that is brewing. It does feel uh, that it's his, a historical juncture. Um, the ambassador has already alluded to it. It's the super electoral year. There will be 50 countries going to the polls, accounting for half of the world's population. Um, among these uh, elections will be, of course, the presidential elections in the United States. There will be the citizens of the European Union and the UK, among others. Um, will be heading to the polls and these countries will be, uh, and they will select the leaders that will shape the transatlantic relationship. And these leaders will be in charge of taking some very hard decisions on some of the most difficult uh, international dossiers. The war in Ukraine, the escalating tensions in the Middle East, potential tensions with China uh, in the South Pacific. And there's also, of course, uh, the future of NATO that uh, turns 75 this year as it considers uh, um, admitting new members, as does the European Union. So um, we are going to discuss all of these issues, hopefully we'll touch upon them. Um, and we're, looking, we're, gonna dis we're gonna think very hard about how to fireproof transatlantic relations uh, in tangible ways as the year progresses. Um, and we're gonna have, as Matem was saying, we're gonna have the opportunity, of course, also to open this up to you, all of you, if you want to ask questions of transatlantic trends, if you want to ask questions, to hear your perspectives uh, in just a while. Now, um, I know that the US elections are on many people's minds in this, uh, in yeah. this, 
in this audience, so we're just gonna go straight Great. to it. And <laughs> Heather, I'm afraid I'm gonna start with you. Okay. So, um, Heather, we don't know what's what's gonna happen, obviously. Um, so maybe with a very broad brush, can you? Tell us your impression of what's at stake in the U.S. elections for the Transatlantic Alliance and for the world. Well, Christina, thank you so much. And if I just may uh, uh, absolutely amplify, we certainly hope uh, to do more programming and be more active uh, as, as GMF here in Madrid. And thank you so much for, for your leadership. Um, as Beth and I were flying here Monday night, and you have rain in Washington, we have snow, and that really shuts us down, so we completely uh, understand delay. We were flying here just as the Iowa caucus was beginning, so I thought, oh, perfect time. And the Wi-Fi on the plane wasn't working very well, so I couldn't see what the results were as, as I was flying here. And just absolutely the perfect place today to have this discussion here. And many, many thanks to Casa America uh, for, for hosting us here. Um, but absolutely perfect storm. It feels like uh, this consequential year is absolutely right upon us. So. What's at stake? Um, so, you know, every, every election is a moment uh, for the governed to shape how they wish to be governed in the future. Just as Martin did an excellent job, it's also a reflection of public perception. And sometimes that public perception doesn't, doesn't follow what we understand as logic or what we believe is logic. In the United States, the economy is doing better, better in many European countries, yet the American people overwhelmingly believe it is not doing well. So perception versus reality is, is something that, that we really have to, to wrestle with uh, in this very consequential year. So I'm gonna, before I say what's at stake, I'm gonna sort of do some preparatory phrasing of this before we jump into this conversation. We have 11 months to go here, colleagues. Um, and so this is a moment, maybe this is my own self-help. Um, we're gonna have to take a very deep breath and take this one step at a time. So uh, during the Iowa caucuses, uh, 108,000 people caucused. Okay, so that's a very, very, very small percentage of a country of 330 plus million people. Um, and there were some very, very specific issues to Iowa that created <coughs> that um, outcome. Next week, we will go to New Hampshire, which has a completely different characteristic and set, and you will get some different results from there. So we have to take this one step at a time. But I think it's most important what's at stake for US, um, uh, for US voters um, they're not going to believe this is what's at stake, but um, they're going to vote on local issues, just like here in Spain when you had your election. Yes, foreign policy, security policy, yes, it matters because it, it fuels how we feel about ourselves. The world's in chaos. Do we feel good about that? Do we not feel good about that? Do we need that sense of control? But it's always local issues. It's how you feel about your economy, how you feel about the problems that are or are, are not being solved in your communities, and who do you believe brings the solutions or best represents how you feel about it? That is exactly what is, is happening in, in, across the United States. And once again, the American people are facing a moment that they face quite frequently. Do we wanna stay engaged in the world? Is that, does that make us more secure and prosperous? Or do we want to come back into ourselves, have our two oceans protect us, our big economy, our muscular military? Should we isolate and make the world go away? And that view is not only held by the right, but it's also held by the left. So it's that sense of, is engagement the better course of action with our allies? Is it isolation and being more self-protective? And I think that's what uh, the, the larger stake for the American people. Now, Sitting in Europe, you'll say, that's not what's at stake for me. What's at stake for me is whether the United States will continue to uh, meet its security obligations. Will it view allies as foes and adversaries as friends? And that, of course, is some, uh, obviously the interpretation of former President Trump's foreign policy view. But I'm gonna, my last final word, 
And this is because I think we have to stay optimistic. We have to stay focused on what's important to us, what we're going to fight for um, every day. Uh, because the sun will rise after November 9th. I promise you it will. I promise you that there will be many, many people fighting for a better future and a better relationship, and we have to take comfort in, in supporting them. And I just, the last word I want you to think, if we reduce the transatlantic relationship to one individual, shame on all of us. It's bigger than that. We all have a role to play in it. We have to play that role regardless of outcome. So that's my both deep cleansing, calming breath as we take a very long journey over the next 11 months. But I'm not going to curse the darkness. I'm going to light a big transatlantic ca uh, candle, and I hope you'll all light that with me. So <laughs> hope that helped you answer your okay, question. Okay, you know. lovely met metaphors. Let me at least still ask you, I, I want to stay with that topic for a moment. Um, more concretely on the election, well, the, the process of the moment of the election and perhaps the aftermath, is American democracy on the line? Is, can something like 6 January happen again? Can you give us perhaps a little bit, both for the immediate electoral moment and for the months after that, um, give a sense of different scenarios that could be conceivable, that could play out? And also, how confident are you in the resilience of the U.S. institutions uh, post electorate in the event that one of the candidates, could, that Trump could win, and he's announced that he wants to do something kind of like a cleansing? Yep. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is the challenge, again, of perception and reality. My perception of January 6th was the most profound challenge to America's democracy in the modern era because it challenged the peaceful transfer of power. I thought that was the wake-up call. It wasn't the wake-up call for our country. Uh, when you look at opinion polling, many in the country don't believe it was that big of a deal or that, again, continue, and this was very true in the Iowa uh, caucus, continue to believe that President Biden is not the legitimate president. Oh, by the way, if you heard President Putin today saying, you know, there's elections, you hear that amplification of our adversaries to help us so those uh, internal divisions. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to re continue as Americans to have, invest in our democratic institutions and having faith in their legitimacy and their process. And of course, that's been undermined for the last several years. So this is a, this is a, this is a moment for American democracy to hopefully find its confidence. And what happened in, in 2020 through a variety of, of individual actions, uh, local election workers that were challenged uh, by the former president to change their position, they stood fast. They may not have stood fast, they stood fast. Up to the Vice, Pre Vice President Pence, who also stood fast mm. to our Constitution. We were fortunate that those individuals did not make a different choice. They could have made a different choice. So every time you bend institutions, democratic institutions, you stretch norms, you stretch limits. There's always a problem that, that like an elastic band, <laughs> you stretch it so far, sometimes it doesn't pop back the way it was. So this is why we have to be incredibly intentional about the health of our own democracy. And, and I think we also have to prepare in scenarios. I believe we should take the former president at his words, what he will do. And we have to assess and understand what the implications are if he would do those, use the Insurrection Act if there were protests, uh, if, if he were to win the election. Um, we have to take those and, and help people who are in those key roles what they should do or what they shouldn't do. There's sometimes there's different things you should resign or maybe you shouldn't resign or maybe you should do. We have to explore mm -hmm. those possibilities. Did I ever think we'd have to do that? No. Um, do we have to do that? Yes. So our democracy is on the line, um, and, but every American has a role to play. That was the lesson for me throughout our election process, and, and hopefully we don't continue to stretch this elastic band yeah. too often, but uh, we may, and we see it being stretched, whether that's in Poland, whether that's uh, in a variety of countries. Advanced democracies are challenging themselves 
and their own, and that's what our opinion polls. Young people don't have faith in democracy. Mm. It doesn't deliver, the system is rigged. So if it's not that great, mm. why am I gonna support it? That's why we have to do so much investment. Mm -hmm. We believe democracy delivers locally the best. That's why problems have to be solved, citizens have to be engaged, they have to be part of the process. Uh, we ha and that's not gonna happen overnight. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a long process, but we've gotta yeah. be there and, and deliver that democracy. Thank you. Well, um, I want to pick up one of the points you made, Beth, uh, maybe to you. What do you think, which are the, the central themes that this election is going to be uh, decided upon? Um, Heather was mentioning, so people really won't vote for the local issues and don't care that much paraphrasing on, uh, on foreign policy as such, as, as we do here. You know? So um, what do you think in the US elections, what, what are going to be the main key themes that we should be looking out for? So first, just let me thank you everybody here um, for inviting us and being part of this today. It's really wonderful experience um, to be sharing our views uh, with people in Spain. So thank you so much. I wanted to add one point to something that Heather said, just to add a little bit more hope also to our positive message here. And that is um, Americans are, a majority of Americans are independents. They are polling in the center. And so we have these fringes on the side, and those people are the ones showing up more at the polls. Um, in Iowa, the people who caucus represented 5% of Iowa uh, folks who could vote, and 15% of Republicans who could vote. So, you know, we, we have fringes in America right now as part of our system who are having more sway, but I actually have hope um, that is much more long term and, and I think that with efforts by <coughs> civil society in building that, we can appeal more to the center which is the majority of our country. And so, you know, we can be hopeful there but we actually have to try. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the themes, I do think it's, it's very much as Heather said, um, this is a, a vote about um, a vision for how our country um, it's about prosperity and domestic prosperity. It's about economics. Um, and unfortunately, uh, President Trump is, is promoting this idea of um, being left out. He's appealing to Americans who feel that they are not doing as well as they should. And so the part of the economy that's hurting these people, even though the overall macroeconomics are good, um, inflation, and that's been experienced by everyone around the world, but in America, it is that they have to spend more on groceries than they did a year ago, a lot more, even though those rates are coming down, and they can't afford housing. I mean, how many countries in the world are we hearing that housing and youth are really frustrated by they can't afford housing? Um, this is a very common theme, and we don't have good uh, solutions for this, but but these kinds of economic themes just go directly into this um, more right-wing populist uh, vocabulary and narrative, and and I think that the one issue that I would point to in terms of foreign policy that really matter to people relate to that, and that's migration. And we were having a conversation last night about this, but this idea of turning migrants into the enemy, <laughs> that they're going to take my jobs, that you know somehow they pose a threat to our culture and to our future. You know, in actuality, that's just not true. Because without migration, most countries in the developed world are not going to prosper. It's just how that migration happens. But instead, it's becoming part of this narrative. And so I think that also is something that we really need to pay attention to. And transatlantically, we could have a conversation about this because we share these challenges. And I don't like the way it's going, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to bring you in, uh, Manuel, on sort of this, the European perspective on all this. But before I do, I would like to come back to, the, to a point you both referred to, which is, Americans are not actually, in terms of metrics, doing that badly, but they, are f they feel they do. And I want to link that up to one of the things that Martin showed in his presentation, mm -hmm. which was, um, uh, which was uh, about the rise of China, right? And um, where also 
uh, both of the candidates in the U.S. elections run on a on a on a ticket of more or less of American line. They run on the message that America is that, that you know that appealing to to that sentiment coming from coming from the population. Um, but the metrics uh, still place the U.S. quite firmly at the top, despite China catching up. So there again, you have this kind of dissonance between the reality, the facts shown as shown by metrics and what people perceive. Mm -hmm. So um, how, where does that disconnect? And I, I'm sure we can find similar disconnects on many of the other topics that we find. So how can we, how can we bring the, 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 the truth more to, <laughs> closer to perception? I know this is like a very, gen very, very difficult question. And the other question is like, um, from that China, uh, from the China, uh, China linkage, um, there was a very interesting cover story in the last issue of Foreign Affairs, where, which, which argued that, um, that not American decline, but American self-confidence is the problem, yeah? Um, is a self-conscious inward turn United States the real danger to the international order, based on this misperception that America is not doing well? I'll come, well, actually, you know, any of yeah. you really, yeah. maybe you want to try. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to take that. So, three quick points about what I think would make a, um, a Trump presidency complicated no, or unique and what makes him very different as a, as a politician and definitely has made him very different as a president and would make him very different as a, as a second term uh, president. So, first is he is, I think, the first president to question deeply the alliance system that the United States built since the end of the Second World War, and very particularly uh, NATO. And that's unique. I mean, that, ha that hadn't happened before him, and we, sh we keep on getting these signals out of his team and folks that were members of his team in, during his uh, first term that he considered uh, leaving NATO, that he signaled that he would leave NATO to European leaders, in or, or that he would not abide by Article 5 commitments of NATO, common defense commitments in NATO. So that is, that is truly unique, and that makes him, I think, very revisionist of the U.S.'s role in the world. So we should be ready, if he comes back into power, for a general weakening of the alliance structure that the U.S. has built. And that is very challenging for Europeans, particularly on the NATO front. The second <laughs> bit that made him very different, um, or maybe much more explicit in office than predecessors had been maybe while well, they were campaigning, but then changed when they were in office is his attitude towards trade and economic interdependence. And as we know, there are, again, signals coming out of his campaign that they're considering a flat-out tariff of 10% on all imports. I mean, these things are truly disruptive, revolutionary to how global trade functions. And for the EU and Europe, we are by far the region that is most dependent on exports and, uh, and of our interlinkages uh, globally uh, for our prosperity. So we have the largest proportion of our GDP uh, coming for trade uh, than any of the other major traders in the world, far larger than China, even though you know, this might surprise folks, larger than the US's. So we're very exposed to this. And then the third bit is his work, uh, his mm -hmm. attempts mm -hmm. to undermine and damage uh, American democracy. And this, this really makes him very unique, because I irrespective of what you think of his other policies, you might like part of his Middle East policy or some of his economic policies. This is indefensible in my mind, and it's what, what I this is going to be his legacy, which is through the attack on American institutions, whether it's the judiciary, the role of the media, ultimately this is his 16th chapel, which is the questioning of the electoral process, you know, as, as he left office. Um, this process of erosion of democratic institutions in the U.S. has implications <laughs> both within the U.S. and abroad. So, and, and this would continue, I think, if he was uh, re-elected, maybe even in a more sophisticated manner, uh, in a more damaging manner to the institutions. This is not unique to the U.S. We've seen this in other places, in Latin America, in Europe. This leadership, so this agency versus a structure dynamic, where you have these very disruptive leaders that are constantly pushing the boundaries of the institutional frameworks that they inherit, democratic. And these might be, you know, again, electoral commissions, electoral processes. Normally, the, juri the judiciary tends to be a very popular target. Uh, you know, <coughs> academic institutions tend to be quite popular as targets of these folks. They attack their independence, uh, their legitimacy. So the question I think we need to ask ourselves is, why is this structural and why is this happening now uh, and in the U.S.? Because I, I lived in the U.S. when Trump first won. 
And, and the country, I think, uh, or the intellectual and policy elites have gone through a number of phases. So the, the first was uh, sort of a de de sort of denial phase. He will not win. Then he won. Then it was this is a this is an oddity. This is something that will go away. Uh, he'll probably will not finish his term. He'll be impeached. You know, he f he finished his term, and then you know he won't come back. And then you're looking at the polls, and clearly in the Republican base, this is a structural issue. So we're going to have to deal with this, whether it's Trump or somebody else in the future. So what is causing this? And and to Beth's point, I mean, I've been, some of us have been looking at the economics for a long time, not just of the U.S. but of advanced economies in general, and they haven't been working out very well for a lot of folks. So the perception might be detached from the reality. The perception might be worse but the reality is very concerning for a lot of folks in our okay. country. So if you look at the last 30 years of economic development in advanced economies, <coughs> there is one pervasive feature in that development. Uh, it changes from country to country, but one of the things that you see that is persistent is a hollowing out of the middle of our income distribution through either income stagnation or income decline in various places. Now, that hollowing out of the middle is highly correlated with the hollowing out of the center of our political spectrum. These things are correlated. Mm -hmm. And the mechanisms by which this affects political behavior are beginning to be understood. So concerns about the future, so for example, pessimism is about the future, one's own future, the future of the next generation, is highly correlated with support for populist uh, radical forces on the, on, the, on the sides of the spectrum. And it's that polarization that is leading to the rise eventually uh, in parliamentary systems is leading to the rise of these forces that are very noisy. In presidential systems, you get these shocks every now and then because they, they, they get to power. Uh, but it's leading to the rise of these political forces that are upending the system from within. Yeah. They're deeply revolutionary. Now, if we do, so final phrase, if we do not address the underlying drivers of this process, mm -hmm. there is so much that the institutional architecture can do. In Venezuela, relatively weak institutional architecture, it took one man it took Chavez, one man, mm. to undo a large part of the, of the democratic uh, architecture. In the U.S., the institutions are very strong, but how many Trump presidencies can the independence of the Supreme Court sustain? You know? How many Trump presidents can the independence of some of these electoral officials in states uh, sustain if he has the capacity to shape uh, the Republican Party and the people that are elected to these jobs? So, I, I, I wouldn't put all of my bet on the institute. There's so much the institutions can do. Yeah. If you have these constant waves of folks that are bent on undoing uh, the legitimacy and the functioning of these institutions. So okay. I think Biden has gotten this right, now, now truly last phrase. I think Biden has gotten this right in the sense that this is a unique um, administration in which he's realized and his team that they need to combine the domestic and the foreign policy agenda. They need to build a much more equitable and fair and just economic development path for the country if they are to sustain American democracy and its international projection, I think they need more time because the yeah. results have not yet been uh, delivered in terms of political behavior, which is a return to the centrality of the electorate in the US. You very well point out that this is not an American oddity and that you know we need to do something about it and that actually the institution, within the democratic institution, there's a lot of leeway to do something about it. So I do want to... Uh, so that, that kind of cues me up nicely to, to, to switch over to the other side of the pond. Maybe, Manuel, if I can stay with you for a moment. Um, help us understand what's at stake in the European Parliament election. And in particular, this week, as there's a showdown in the European Parliament, yep. where exactly you can see this push, the constitutional pushback against, uh, um, against the hijacking of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of Ukraine uh, support in this case. Um, by Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban and the European and, and the members of the European Parliament are pushing back through different means against this. So, um, um, I, can you explain to us? You just said what's to be done, or in the U U in the U.S. context, can you give us a little bit of the idea of, conversely, what's at stake? What, what's the European version of this? What is it that? That, that you know of the, the expression of power. We all know you know how the rise of uh, of, um, of right wing um, populism in Europe. But right now, how is it that uh, the EU institutions are being hollowed out? And what do you think? What is your feeling about the European Parliament elections in particular? What is at stake there? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, this manifests itself differently in <laughs> in, in different places. But uh, there's sort of an anti elite. Um, 
thread that cuts across this behavior. So it's anti-elite, by the way, in terms of intellectual, political, <coughs> economic elites. There's a loss of trust in these elites, a loss of trust in the projects that they have defended, including multilateralism, international trade, EU integration. <coughs> if you look at, by the way, the uh, you know, studies on how these processes have functioned over time, e elites are fundamental, and, and people trusting and delegating to these elites, a lot of decision-making capacity is fundamental. So a lot of the anti-trade movement actually feeds off the perception of folks uh, that these elites have not delivered across the board. It's not people being an expert on you know, X or Y uh, treaty on uh, you know, sort of trade ag agreement. No? So this anti-elitism plays out differently uh, across, uh, across uh, Europe. I'm very worried about uh, politics in France, for example. Mm. I'm very worried about politics in Germany and uh, support for the AFD. Uh, this, um, you know, we've, uh, we, we have a situation in this country where we have a lot of support for extremes in the, in the political spectrum as well, and that is playing out fundamentally in this place regionally and locally, um, and that has effects on the way our, our democracy functions. So this will, uh, it's a, it's sort of, you, if you look at the nodes of the concert of politics in the West, they look disconnected, but the symphony is a, is, is a symphony of disorder it's a, and, a, and of growing disorder. And it's an underlying fracture, if you ask me, an underlying fracturing of our social contract that, is to, that, that we need to address. And it's a, it's a, a very structural process. And, and I, you know, just to bring back the, the pain, you know, the driver of this, there are communities in the US where the life expectancy of children is shorter than that of their parents. There are places, the, the, the age at which people access homes in this country has gone up by, by over a decade. The suicide rates, it's at record levels in this country. There, I mean, you take all of these metrics of socioeconomic pain and you have to wonder why the response isn't even harder than the one that we're seeing. So no wonder these folks are voting for politicians that are promising to break the system. Um, so unless we address that, and it's a very structural debate, it's very complicated, it involves economics, uh, politics, trade issues, I mean it's very complicated how we build that new social contract. And the fact that, the final phrase, the fact that we're failing at this is a real <laughs> failure of intelligence, which drives me nuts because if you look at the aggregate, we have never been more prosperous than we are yeah. today. We're at record levels of GDP. We've never lived longer lives in the aggregate mostly, although in the US the aggregate life expectancy is now going down because of the effects of these groups so on the average. But on the whole, we've never had more access to information or better health care. So we're failing at the management of abundance. It's, um, I mean, it's astonishing to look at, there's this big contradiction between the aggregate figures of prosperity and how this is being, just, it's a justice issue. So if we don't address it, you're gonna see a European parliament that'll be more tilted to the right or the left. It, start to <coughs> behave in odd ways, he'll be very difficult to legislate things, he'll question decisions by the council on strategic issues, or you get governments in Europe that will disagree on fundamental elements of policy, the European integration process will slow down, but it's that symphony that I was, uh, that I was referring to before, and the US is in my mind the bigger, the bigger piece in all of this. Heather, well, we've, we're failing at the management of the abundance, <laughs> I'm going to pin that. <laughs> um, Heather, I, I do want to go, talking of institutions, I do want to go a little bit uh, to talk about NATO, European security, but before I do, with this, the, the way that, uh, that Manuel just has characters, that, do you recognize that as in, in reference to the United States? Oh, are, are similar, I mean, what you're hearing is the similarities. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I, was, I, I can be more clinical about Europe, and you can be more clinical yes. about the United States. But our mm -hmm. passions run in the same way, and it's the exact same thing, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the challenge we're facing, whether it's migration, healthcare, cost of living, crime, problem solving for locals, and again, the, the view that for 20 plus years, it, there's been failure. Failure mm -hmm. to address problems, failures to adjust this massive economic shift that it, in fact, yes, is China produced. When China joined the international trading sy system, the distortions were significant, <laughs> and particularly significant, significant for certain groups. And until there's an answer for that, the politics are going to be very, very difficult. And it is a populist moment right now, because everything seems wrong. No one seems to have clear answers to that. So who is to blame for our mm -hmm. troubles? That is the age-old problem you can blame the other, migrants, you can blame 
um, you know, the wokeness and social issues and fo folks that have different views, you, you, blame, uh, you blame the other. So mm. absolutely, and this is, there's a lack of self-confidence here. It's, it's Dixonian, it's the best of times. Mm. It is the worst of times. And we haven't been able uh, mm -hmm. to, to manage that. So on NATO, Manuel, maybe I'll challenge you a, a little bit. I just, I feel like there are cycles in American history uh, and it, it, the fact is the last 75 years was an out of cycle moment. And, and I think that's what, we're, mm -hmm. that's what we're grappling with because uh, usually when the United States has a burst of international engagement, it ends and then we go, well, we're not gonna do that again. And we come home and we isolate. And that's our <coughs> instinct. Um, in 1940, you know, post 1945, the greatest generation made a very different decision. And I'm almost struck that we're not, you know, in more in awe of that change of direction because they froze this international alliance system in Asia and Europe. Now again, global events were, were transformative to that. But as I said, for GMF, that our, we're a living memorial to the Marshall Plan. That's why I always raise the history of the Marshall Plan mm -hmm. because it was such an insanely different decision that we didn't have to make. We had done our part in Europe. It was time to come home, bring, you know, the boys were home and we had nation building to do at home. But we <coughs> made a decision, a calculus, that it was in our interest to invest in Europe and two years later then to sign the Washington Treaty and to protect that prosperity and that dem democracy. That was a, a decision that could have gone a very different way depending on a whole different group of people and it was not predestined. So the fact that we were outward facing for so long mm -hmm is actually the historical anomaly. Yes. So we're going back to this moment, and this is where, again, Martin's explanation of what I think we should all be very self-critical about is this generational gap. We have done a terrible job helping a new generation that ha didn't have to live the experience of the Second World War, didn't have to live the early experiences of, of the Cold War. I came of age and only the benefits <laughs> Berlin Wall fell, you know, Central Europe <coughs> became free and everything looked possible. That was when Casa America was founded in 1992. The era of possibilities were open to, to us all. Now we have to fight harder for it and help a generation understand those core values in their terms, not in our terms, mm -hmm. in their terms. Mm -hmm. That's what we're failing to do. Uh, and that's really our task. Um, and they have different ideas and different perspectives about it. So I, I jokingly say I, I have uh, two daughters. Um, one is 25, one is 20. Uh, I have to make them care about NATO as much as I care about NATO. I'm not doing a great job, let me put it straight out <laughs> here. Uh, um, they know mom cares about it a lot and they're very embarrassed if I were talking like this and they, would, they knew that. Uh, but they have to care about it in their way. They have to understand what's important to them and then they have to understand that it's worth protecting and worth funding. But this is, again, the, the devastation of transatlantic trends was there's yeah. relativism. Yeah, we all mm. are terrible. And if you're equating China with the United States, despite all of our problems, we got a bigger problem than that. And so we ha that's for me. Mm. It's building, it's rebuilding the relationship to NATO from the ground up. It's not building it from the top down. Top down, if, if, if the former president returns, yeah, it's going to shake the tenets of this relationship. And maybe in shaking that, we have to rebuild yeah. it because when you lose something, then you appreciate what its value was. I hope we never, ever get that far. Um, but we have to regrow it nonetheless, regardless of, you know, these statistics where when President Biden, who's the greatest Atlanticist that we will have as a president, that, you know, Barack Obama was not an Atlanticist. He, he, he folks thought more of the, uh, the, the Asia Pacific moment as the future. And even now we have these, these trends. Uh, so this is something we all have to do. It is regardless of who yeah. enters the White House. I don't disagree. A word <laughs> of, of how profound this is. I would also just note, it, it, not that you, you know, go through sort of the former president's history, how he feels about Germany and the automotive is exactly how he felt about Japan in the 80s. This is sort of a, mm -hmm. it comes back. Uh, and, and again, the fundamental thing about allies, we win together, we get stronger together. In the former president's mindset, it's a complete win-lose <coughs> calculation. If our allies get stronger, America gets weaker. Mm -hmm. And, and that, you know, we, that, that's a mindset that we have to help all the Americans, uh, American people understand, and I think we can do that. 
their jobs are dependent on European investment in their companies and Europeans buying American products and vice versa. Yes. Our strength is, is mutual and we've got to get out of our own ways in many perspectives mm -hmm. to do that. So it mm -hmm. is a complicated task. Yeah, I would say on the, I, I just want to take the China issue yeah, here please. as part of this equation and you know, this idea that we saw so clearly this, that you know, the United States is declining and China is rising, which is absolutely China's talking point. <laughs> so congratulations to China and um, their talking points um, on getting uh, the youth vote on that. That does not mean that is true. And I actually do not believe that in 2028, China will be more influential in really, you know, any ways when you look at power competition. Mm -hmm. So I do wonder, you know, a lot of times in these polls, um, what does what does influence mean? Like, what are people thinking of? And I and I think it might get to economic and trade influence, but let's not forget that China is not 10 feet tall. And in fact, that social contract idea and breaking the social contract, I believe that Chinese people believe that the government Just during COVID contract. broke the social contract with them. I don't see a lot of people uh, you know, having babies in China because <coughs> they either can't afford it or they don't want to. You know, their youth unemployment, the fact that none of their cities, not one, lives up to WHO um, uh, environmental standards. They can't breathe. Half of their public doesn't have access to clean water. I mean, you know, it is a fundamentally, um, a, a place where none of us actually want to live hmm. for lots of reasons. From the fact that we don't know if the police are going to show up and knock on our door or we're going to have an exit ban <coughs> on us and we won't be able to leave the country because somehow we've done some research that might offend that government. So I do think that, you know, in the long run, um, we have to understand too, and I really wish Ameri uh, Europeans would understand that only the United States has the capacity and has had the will to protect all of us. And when you look at what's happening in the Middle East right now in terms of the Red Sea, where is most of that shipping that's being blocked through the Suez and is going around the Cape of Good Hope? Where is that trade going? Yeah. Europe, not the United States. Most of that trade is between China and Europe. Who is there defending the Red Sea? The United States, spending hundreds of millions of dollars doing that. And I, and I think that, um, you know, here's where I think Europe may be looking ahead and dealing with a potential of, John, of Donald Trump, but maybe in general. It's kind of a recognition of the shared role that we have, but also the fact that the United States has and continues to give a lot <coughs> to the global <coughs> common. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the fact that the United States now is producing and exporting more oil than anyone else. The fact that the price of natural gas in Europe is actually low this year comparatively, that's because the United States is now the number one LNG exporter in the world and provided all of this to Europe. So I, I really would love for us just to be more transparent and to talk about the things where we help each other and that there's mutual recognition there. Yeah. And for a Donald Trump that's going through a ledger with a calculation on each side, it would be great if, um, you know, if Europe could be more clear about the things that we also provide and, and what Europe is doing in exchange. And, and from our perspective too, from mm -hmm. the United States perspective, to recognize the different kind of things that Europe provides, not the same but complementary. Lots of cues, yeah, okay. just a second, lots of cues, but we, um, we, we're going to go back to China and to the Middle East uh, in more depth in a, in a moment, but I do think that this topic, what you say, so who's going to take care of the European uh, security uh, um, is, is the core theme, and 
Um, and I, I do want to get, um, uh, do you have a thing to finger on, on anything that's related to China or the Middle China, East? Or the but I China, but Okay, well, I'll, I'll come back to you on that. Um, I, I would like to have a quick round of fire with you, Heather, on, on NATO, just uh, very, very sort of uh, staccato. What's NATO's agenda for this year in particular? What do you expect from the NATO summit in DC to deliver? Uh, what are the prospects of enlargement? Will tr Trump less US, US leave the NATO? Um, which is a question that, <laughs> you know, well, look that at pops up a lot of conversation. <laughs> anyway, so what's NATO's agenda for, for, for this year? I, I, think, I think Washington's still grappling <coughs> with that agenda. It is a big agenda. New Secretary General will be named. Hopefully Sweden will be welcoming our 32nd member in our 75th year. Um, regional defense plans, which we thought we had some time to spend, now we don't. They're going to have to be accelerated. Um, of course, Ukraine and the language uh, around Ukraine's future membership into NATO, which was obviously a, a <coughs> failure at the, the Vilnius summit. My, my concern is that the timing of this summit um, is right in the middle of our campaign season. Uh, in fact, the, the actual summit will be four days before the Republican National Convention, and I just, what, what I want GMF to make sure we're focusing on is the bipartisanship of NATO. So NATO isn't just for one party, it is for every American, whether you're an independent, a Republican or Democrat, it provides security for us all. That uh, the American people understand that there, it, yes, there are costs to this security, uh, but there are benefits, and we've lost that part of the ledger of describing the benefits of, of the alliance. So I, I think the, I, I don't know what the major themes will be um, yet. I think they're still to be determined. I think if I was in the White House and the timing of it, you want a, a very positive, non-controversial summit four days before you know the campaign season hits. I think there will have to be more consequential decisions made at that summit, which may be a little bumpier and a little bit more uncomfortable than the White House uh, would prefer. But I, I think we have to be very aggressive. This is not a year to say, oh, 75 years, aren't we great? The greatest military history alliance in the world. Nope, we have to be ready for the next 75 years. And this is what we're going to be doing. And this is why you know, we are, are strong and but have more work to do. And so this is going to be a very, very challenging NATO summit, I think, more challenging than I think we're giving it mm -hmm. credit for right now. But um, stay tuned, let's do a lot of work and make it, make it the impactful summit that it has to be. Okay, um, maybe we stay for a moment on, on Ukraine. So um, again, um, what Martin um, presented on the public support in Ukraine seems to sit quite oddly with the current difficulty or to secure sustained financial support uh, from the governments <coughs> both on, on both sides on the Atlantic. Why is it so difficult if the public is behind this? Yeah, is there a disconnect somehow between the so public and the So right now the leadership? vote to get the $61 billion aid package and tragically has nothing to do with Ukraine right now. It has gotten caught up in negotiations of border security, keeping the government open, our debt, our government spending. Israel is caught up in this, Taiwan's caught up in this, Ukraine is caught up into it. Um, so that's the challenge uh, right now. I, you know, on, on the one hand, the Biden administration has done a magnificent job uh, from the earliest days from intelligence sharing to working with the Europeans very closely on sanctions package and on the unity of approach here to Ukraine. So I want to give them 100% credit for that. Where I'm critical of the US and NATO response, we never, have, we never had a theory of victory. Our theory mm. of victory was getting two parties to a negotiating table. There's no negotiating table. <laughs> There's never been a negotiating table. And um, while we were touting our lovely slogan for as long as it takes, that was Mr. Putin's slogan, thank you. <coughs> and democracies have to build strong public support for a long campaign. Right. And we didn't do that. And I think we're all paying the price of that. What does this mean? How long, what, what, what happens if Ukraine isn't successful? What are the costs there? Um, and, and to be honest with you, uh, we were self-deterred. 
the incrementalism was we were afraid of um, crossing red lines for Russia and escalating the conflict. We are always afraid of escalation. And you know what? Our adversaries go, okay, let's go. Let's go when we voice our fears. Um, and I don't mean to say there's legitimate concerns about escalation. I, I don't mean to suggest that. I don't mean to suggest that we are provocative in any way. But when we tell the adversary what we're afraid of, that adversary leans right into that. And that's what we've, we've done. We have to have a clear view of what we believe victory is and then give all means disposable to achieve that. And NATO has a lot of self-censoring when or not uh, playing into Russia's hands, when not offering Ukraine a clear path to membership. So absolutely, absolutely. By, say, by saying that, we're acknowledging that they have a vote at the table. Mm. Ukraine itself says we should not come into to NATO uh, as we are at war but you take every step possible mm -hmm. to get there, and when that geopolitical window opens, you fly through it. Sweden and Finland prepared, prepared, and when the, the window opened, they flew through it. Sweden hasn't flown as quickly as I, we all would like for a variety of reasons. That's what it means. That's mm -hmm. what we need to do. It's clear, short, declarative language. The Vilnius uh, statement set us back. It walked back, it went through a process that again, uh, is a labyrinth. Keep it short, keep it simple, mm -hmm. and keep Ukraine focused on being as close to NATO as possible, and when that window opens, it will join. Uh, so it, this is where um, the, 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 the challenge is, uh, the President of the United States is afraid of the escalatory ladder, and, and we are prohibiting ourselves from being bolder, uh, and this war will go on for a very long time and it will continue to cause life. And if, and if Ukraine fails this year because of lack of ammunition and lack of things, we are all going to be paying a very large price and more U.S. forces uh, that will be required, more defense spending because now our security is going to be much more directly impacted. And that's the part of the conversation we're, we're not having because we yeah. don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about it. A victory, but we're not using all means necessary to do that. I was very glad with President Macron's statement, uh, his his uh, conference yesterday. France needed to do much more very early mm -hmm. on. Uh, they need to continue to do more. Germany has stepped forward. This is fantastic. We need everyone to step forward. Ukraine has to be successful, or we're all going to pay a very high price. But I'm wondering, I'm intrigued. How how is this going to how is this you so perceived Ukraine fatigue and all this reluctance? and this deadlock gonna go away if there's no, as I understand you, if the US and Europeans don't have a shared understanding on how they envisage this conflict to end. How, is there any path that you envisage how to get there? Uh, so again, this is, you have to have very clear, transparent conversations with your citizens and that, that's also been a little bit missing. We're doing that a lot now at GMF. We're going on a whistle stop tour. We're going to uh, 11 American cities in, in the heartland. We're just talking to people. What's important to you? What, what are values are you prepared to, to pay for or not pay for? If you don't like high energy prices, now they've come down, but when they spiked, when farmers can't get fertilizer, when mm -hmm. they can't get seed, um, it, you're impacted. We can't isolate ourselves from, from that impact. When you describe to, uh, to Americans about freedom and protection of land and sovereignty, that has resonance. Um, when you say we're only spending 3% of our defense spending and the, the, the Ukrainian military is holding the Russian military at bay, that's a good return on investment. You have to just describe it very yeah. differently. But if you don't tell people what's important and what they have to invest and the sacrifice they have to make, if you're telling them there's no sacrifice, they don't feel involved in it. Uh, if you don't tell them what's at stake, then um, it, it is hard to build public mm -hmm. support. So I think we all have a lot of work to do. Manuel, um, yeah, so the question is maybe to you. Um, do you think Ukraine is gonna fall victim to, the, to this war fatigue and the domestic polarization in both uh, on the US and EU um, societies? And perhaps you can draw that question even larger with regard to a lot of the dossiers we're talking about here. How can we, isolate the big geopolitical dossiers that do need solving from the domestic skirmishes, polarization, so on, so they're not hijacked by domestic politics. 
You, you cannot. I mean, uh, it's, um, <laughs> you, you cannot do it. No, and I, and I think one of the things that we have learned uh, over the last decade or so is that this separation of the international from the domestic, which some IR uh, scholars like to do, is, um, is ineffective. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't explain the world. It doesn't explain how things function. Um, I think this is a pivotal year for Ukraine, and I think the most pivotal event for Ukraine are going to be the U.S. elections. So you have to go back to the U.S. elections and see who wins and what the agenda is. Um, I mean, I've, I've been following the debate in the U.S. Uh, on this somewhat, and I think on the whole, that it, there are differences across the candidates on the Republican mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. but if a Republican was to win, I think on the whole, the sensitivity towards the Asia-Pacific and China is greater, and the idea that you would need to rebalance and maybe focus more forces and more energy in, uh, on the China theater, I think is much more uh, generalized on the Republican side, so that would have an impact on, on the Ukraine dossier. So this is a, a really pivotal year, and it's, it's about domestic politics, because it's about the results uh, in, many of these, uh, in, in many of these constituencies, but fundamentally uh, in the US. I wanted to add something on, on, on what was commented before, which is, uh, you know, the experience for Europe when the U.S. retracted and started looking inwards is not a great experience. It's it gets cold. very cold in Europe, you know, mm -hmm. and it's very hard to see or to imagine the international uh, liberal architecture without the U.S. being a central part of it. Um, so if the U.S. was to move into another phase of uh, detachment from the international agenda, I mean, what really, one really has to wonder what would happen to very fundamental elements of the international architecture, the things that we value yes. very deeply, like internet. We've taken for granted mm -hmm. many issues that have been, in fact, to a large extent, U.S. built, uh, yes. including, by the way, international trade, uh, although the U.S. has retracted from that in recent decades, but it was the big architect of that uh, at the beginning. International mobility, many of us have benefited from that. You know, the porousness of borders. I mean, these are, th th there's, there's a, a very American world that has been built from which we benefited, and Europeans have then supported that environment. So, and I, I worry very much about the provision of global public goods. You know, there's this whole theory about uh, something called the Kindleberger Trap. It's very interesting, you know, when you have a country that declines relatively, it's maybe less willing to provide for these global public goods. It made a lot of sense for the US to police all of the waterways and all the trade in the world when it was 40% of global GDP. Maybe it makes less sense now unless others step up and do it together with the US, which is something that the Europeans uh, should probably be doing uh, more of. So that's a very negative, I think, scenario for Europe. And on, on ch can I say something about China? Can I put um, we'll be right back. Just okay. I, I haven't forgotten. I'll be right back. Actually, okay. um, I <laughs> wanted to. <laughs> we have uh, time is running. We want to also open it up soon to all of you. Um, let me just open a quick parenthesis on on the Middle East, since you mentioned the Red Sea, uh, Beth. Uh, and I want to call upon you. Um, um, what do you think? So the United States on the, uh, has been under heavy criticism, especially from the global south, but also across the world, um, uh, because of the way that well, while standing with Israel as its allies in response to the 7th October attacks uh, by Hamas, it has well been perceived as indifferent to Palestinian suffering, essentially, and to the siege and bombing of, of Gaza by Israeli, Israeli forces. How do you think... Mm, do you think this has done lasting damage to the U.S. reputation, soft power in the world? Okay, how can you explain yeah, this I, approach? I don't, I, yes and no. I mean, I think that the people who already, the, the publics, the Arab publics, if you look at the polling, um, the United States was already polling extremely low, extremely negative. So I, you know, ironically, sadly, it, it hasn't really moved the needle on that. Um, you know, it's still not a popular United States position um, in terms of what's going on. But I actually don't think that the publics, again, very sadly, in the Arab world, make a difference in overall uh, policy and outcomes because the leaders of those countries, while they have to be very cognizant of what their publics think, they are still bought into um, the American uh, drive to create um, a, an architecture that would support long-term peace in the Middle East and you know, the next step of Saudi 
Israel normalization is still very much on the table, and the Saudis this week reiterated that, right? So, you know, I think that the, the main problem has been over the past um, decade or so, and there's been criticism of the United States of putting um, the Palestinian cause on the back burner. But I also have to add that, you know, there has been almost no Israeli support for a two-state solution during this period. And so, you know, uh, while I wish that we had done more, looking in hindsight, I also, we have to accept the realities of the people who live on the ground and need to make these decisions themselves. The United States can't come in and wave a magic wand and change where the Israeli public is. And right now, the Israeli public mm -hmm. is further from a two-state solution than they have been uh, really since the beginning of the Israeli state. So, so there are a lot of dilemmas here. Um, what I wish the United States would do is to be able to articulate more clearly and to hold two thoughts in our heads at the same time. Hamas is a terrorist organization, period. It is, it has wrought, you know, untold trauma to the Israeli country, the Israeli public. Um, there is no justification, even if a lot of us looking at Israeli politics say that what they did in the past was not fair or good toward the Palestinian people. I certainly am among those. But at the same time, what Hamas did, you can't ever justify. Yeah. So, you know, can we hold the thought in the, our heads that Israel, um, that Hamas is horrible and the Palestinians are suffering and we need to bring this to a different and faster conclusion? But, you know, the dilemmas, unfortunately, again, just yesterday, 50 rockets went into central Israel from Gaza because Hamas still retains the capacity and the intent to threaten Israel. And they intend to stay. And that's actually the most likely outcome here. Yeah, but talking can about... I, can I, sorry, can yes. I disagree just on one thing which I think is relevant, which is on the perception of this conflict beyond the Arab world. So I think we make a mistake in Europe and in the United States because I, I, if, if we underplay how a unifying issue the Palestinian cause is in the Global South, so um, if you go to, I mean, almost the totality of Latin America, I agree, uh, Africa, I agree, and Asia, I did not hit yeah. on the other countries. I was focused on the Arab public, sorry. Yeah. I agree, and I so think there is that a cost. There is a cost to this stance. Absolutely. In a, in, large, in a large part of the world. I mean, we've seen South Africa. I, I, think, and I think that's absolutely right, and I think that this ability of China in particular to rally um, Global South forces and use it as yet another part of their narrative of how the United States is out of touch. That is really important, even though I think it is, on China's part, just, um, again, it's just yeah. a talking point. It's, it's BS. It was not, if I may, Jack, there was not only Chinese propaganda. If you look at the votes and in the UN General Assembly, yes. where the United States and, the Euro and some of the Europeans were actually the ones who uh, were isolated against the rest of the world, you know, um, in that on that question, I think that is reason for concern for us. And I'm absolutely you know, for, for yeah. huge reason co for yes. concern. No, but but the idea shot. that China is going to be the solution here is also no, no, no. smoking dope. Mm. You know, I mean, they're literally sitting in the Red Sea, watching us perform all of the efforts to protect shipping, and they are projecting from their boats the message, all Chinese crew on their, on their cargo shipping so those ships aren't attacked. But I guess it a, there's a, so a pattern awful. repeating itself from what, when we do Ukraine discussion of what's the end game, yeah? Um, and if you step back a, a, a little bit from this si particular situation in Gaza and in the Red Sea right now, I think it seems to me that the, the, um, the, what happens in the, the inflaming situation in the Middle East is a little bit of a study of what happens when the, EU, when the U.S. recedes, right? Vacuums open up, we've seen this in several places. Vacuums open up, uh, the, our com the competitors come in and wreak havoc in different ways uh, according to their interests. So is the UN, United States under this condition? And right now it seems it cannot leave. Where's so, the pivot? So I'm going to yeah. caveat that and, and, and I if I could criticize the U.S. And, and European position, 
we have this mantra of management and stability. Mm. And there's a fine line between stability and stagnation. And we have been stagnant in our policies towards the Middle East because the parties themselves have helped ferment some of that stagnation. What our adversaries in your China example, they know what they want regionally and they work towards that end. We don't, we don't clarify what we want and then what assets are we willing to put forward to it or not. We want, of course, understandably the stability and just, we're trying to manage a status quo that no longer is, exists. The status mm -hmm, quo has mm -hmm. been reduced over the last decade plus. I, what I'm struck, I follow the Western Balkans quite closely. We have repeated the same thing for the last decade and nothing on the ground is matching our reality. We're not doing anything differently, but we're hoping we're managing and stabilizing. Who's managing us are the leaders that are managing us because they know what words that we need to be quiet and go away and not ask them to do tough things or change the situation. So I would argue this is actually, uh, the, the disruption, if it's, it's happening, lean into the disruption. And now we need from a, a democracy values-based partnership to figure out what we do want this world to look like. We're trying to manage something. Our adversaries have another worldview. What, is, what's our, how, what do we want in the next 10, 20 years? We just cannot define that because we just want stability and management and not to be disruptive. And this is really a time for new outside of the box thinking, uh, diplomacy, uh, economic issues. We, have, we don't have new moves. We're repeating the same thing over and over again, mm -hmm. hoping for different results. Of course, that is Einstein's theory of insanity. Mm -hmm. we, we need to have some new calibrations and calculations here. Our adversaries need to be a little, um, have, to be start, have to start reacting to us. Right now, we simply are a posture of reacting to the what the world gives us and try to stabilize and, and manage mm -hmm. it. And it's just becoming less and less yeah. effective, I fear. And I think with the same paradigm, and I don't know, Heather, if you and I agree on this or not, but I think that understanding the new paradigm where you know these middle powers yep. have a lot more agency and instead of kind of you know, um, expecting everybody just to kind of follow behind us, I think we need to proactively be engaging a, uh, with this paradigm and understand um, that they have a role and, and actually raise the stakes for them in terms of, well, mm -hmm. okay, what are you bringing to the table? That doesn't mean we seed, um, you know, the playing field, but we say, oh, there are more players. You actually need to come and play. As I, uh, the example I like, you know, you think 20 years ago, what cities were instrumental in the Middle East peace process? Oslo, Madrid. Mm -hmm. What cities are instrumental in the peace process? Doha. Um, these yeah. exactly uh, these powers have enormous flexibility and I think because we have not had uh, a new approach to these mm -hmm. things and they're offering their services and they are uniquely they are supportive of China Russia they you know are, they're using their diplomatic skills uh, in ways that are are in, they're sub in some ways they're filling that diplomatic vacuum as Completely. well Okay, that cues us up to China. I'm Good. giving up now, Manuel. So Sorry, um, can Held you back not? for too long. Ready to go. <laughs> no, and then let's get the um, audience. No, I, I, I do want to know. Um, well, bef bef before that, just one, one, one half sentence. I, I do need to get from you since we're in Spain here, and Spain has had uh, on the Middle East situation a quite a particular uh, position. Yeah. Uh, unlike uh, uh, most of the other EU, other member states has been really, mm, I could say, you know, taking, you know, trying to. Um, lobby within the EU for a more position that is more favorable to Palestinian interests as well. And Sanchez has said repeatedly that Spain would be willing to, um, to recognize the state of Palestine um, yeah. if the others in the EU don't, won't. Now we have the situation uh, with the um, maritime mission in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain a little bit what, 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 what's the background of that? Um, and well, how I mean, it, to do it very briefly, <laughs> I, I think the the reading from here is that uh, irrespective of the other initiatives that we've seen in the region recently, particularly the Abraham Accords and others which I, I, I think are perceived as, as positive uh, on the whole from here, we still have an underlying justice issue uh, about the Palestinian people. And this has not been resolved mm -hmm. and the, there will be a conflict I forever if we try to address this over the heads of the Palestinians. And what we are living is the consequence of us not addressing the underlying justice issue uh, that affects uh, the fate of the But we knew that for a long time. But, you know, but so uh, it seems we chose not to 
not to look at it. And for okay. some time, and I, you know, I, I think you know, we assumed mm. that the Abram Accords were sufficient. And they might be positive, but they're insufficient. Because at the end of the day, you still have the destiny of millions of Palestinians that has not been resolved, their political rights have not been resolved, and we have an issue that we need to address. And if we do not address it, this will happen again and again. These episodes of violence uh, against the Israelis, the Israelis against the Palestinians will continue to occur. I think that is the Spanish stance, and our hope, is, and the government has suggested that there be a peace conference uh, or uh, a negotiation or, uh, on this, is that we take this and make it the core of the conversation. Because if it's not the core, then it's simply not addressed. And um, that, is our, that is our hope. And of course, the European stance on the conflict itself is that there are very clear manifestations that the conflict is, that the response is disproportionate, and there are issues there of abiding by international law and others, which has been, I think, the European stance across the board on what we're seeing. And this is not, of course, a justification of the attacks on October. In fact, I remember very vividly uh, following the attacks on Twitter because uh, Twitter was very raw and unfiltered in the days, uh, in the day and the days after the attack. So you could actually see the brutality of what happened in, in Israel, which is completely indefensible. And of course, Israel has a right to defend itself, but even self-defense has to comply with international rules uh, of conflict. And there, I think there are serious questions as to the way that the war is being conducted. And that is, I think, the Spanish stance. But the more fundamental issue is about how we address the, the, the underlying driver of the conflict, which has not been addressed in decades. And yeah. you, you're absolutely right that the parties themselves have not been particularly inclined to do this. And the current Israeli government is probably one of the least inclined in, in recent decades to address this in a structural way. But I think it falls on us as the international community to try to get the parties to address this underlying issue, because the consequences Agreed. of them not doing this uh, spill over to everybody else beyond themselves, actually, who are clearly paying the highest, uh, the highest price. Yeah. OK, um, time flies. Uh, you're going to get your turn just in just a second. Um, China. Mm -hmm. So um, we had the Taiwanese elections on 13th of January, uh, the expected results, I gather. Um, how do you evaluate the, uh, the outcome, Emmanuel? How likely do you think are, within this year, we're looking at 2024, right? What do you expect in China, EU or trans uh, EU US China relations in this year? How likely is a rise of tensions in the Indo Pacific or even a hot conflict with China over Taiwan in 24 or 25? So on the part of the Taiwanese, I, I mean, I see them going up as they have done politically all the way up to the line of uh, announcing or proclaiming independence. I don't see them going all the way to, you know, actually doing that. I think that'll be, that'll be extremely irresponsible. So I think the Taiwanese are, are really watching this uh, to some extent from the sidelines, trying to, trying to keep uh, elements of the status quo. So I, I don't see the Taiwanese triggering uh, themselves uh, conflict in the in the strait. Now the relationship between China and the U.S. I may be wrong, but I, I I mean I was just in China. I try to go as much as I can to the region. I don't see a single factor in the bilateral relationship or in the dynamics in the region that leads me to thinking that the relationship will improve. So there's nothing in the domestic politics of China that hints at that. Rather the opposite. <laughs> nothing in the politics of the U.S. Rather the opposite. There's nothing in the geoeconomic competition that points to a easing unless there's a real recession and implosion of the Chinese economy, which I think nobody's today predicting, maybe a slowdown of growth, which is what we're seeing. Uh, but so Chinese competition for the frontier of the economy and for strategic sectors in the tech space will continue to be very severe, which is clearly fueling the conflict uh, or the collision uh, on the trade side and on others. Um, I don't see any dynamic in the region. So I, if you go to Australia, you go to India, uh, you go to the Philippines, you go to Vietnam, most of these US uh, allies, which have different types of entanglements with the US, um, are probably going to be pulling the US into the region rather than easing uh, relations between China and the US. So in the next five years, again, maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't see any, any driver of improvement of the relationship. So I, I think this will get worse. I think this is structural. And just a comment, which is the one that I wanted to make before, because this is not just about these objective drivers of the, of the competition. 
there is a normative systemic dimension to the competition, which I think many folks have underplayed, particularly in Europe, we tend to not fully understand how problematic the nature of the political system in China is correctly uh, for the United States and should be uh, to a large extent for Europeans, how technology is playing into the emergence of a completely new political system in China where individual freedom and agency is not at the core of the system but rather surveillance and inferring uh, people's preferences mm -hmm. from surveilled behavior. I mean, this is, and, and if you go to China, this is a system that is being deployed through massive surveillance mechanisms and also the integration of data at very high levels and the configuration of policy responses based on that data. And a fascinating case, an example of this is the social credit scheme and others. So there is the emergence of a radically different political system uh, happening in China as we speak. Uh, so the collision is not just economic, security, technological, I mean, it is normative. So it's here to stay. And we're being challenged, I'll finish on this, on our output legitimacy. So political systems can have input legitimacy because we participate and we co-own the process, or they can have output legitimacy, which is what are the, you know, what are the results of the system. And democracies tend to have both. The Chinese system is almost entirely built on output, and they're very explicit about this, you know. We, we, our legitimacy is based on the results that we have delivered on security, on growth, and this and that. Um, so we're being challenged as democracies on our output capacity, which takes me back to the point where I began, which is if we don't fix the output capacity of our systems, and if we continue to give signals of fracture, internal fracture, and inability to deliver for our citizens, this is, this is for everybody to see. This is for the Turkeys of the world, for the Indonesians of the world, you know, for the um, say Saudi Arabians of the world that are watching and they're, you know, to, for them to see. So there's a, there's a systems legitimacy collision happening globally. And the Chinese are playing this card that their system produces growth. And they can export this. And to some extent they are through the export of technology. We know of cases in Latin America and in other places. So just to try to sort of connect this with the first part of the discussion. If we don't get the growth and equity piece right, uh, and the output piece, right? I think you know we're going to have a very rough uh, set of years um, globally because there's now an alternative system that can claim that it produces uh, results, and it's alternate. It's a it's a different system, right to the core of where individuals fit in that system. Yeah. I, I just add just quickly. What we don't know is what inevitable reunification means in terms. Uh, this is Beijing's terminology on economic coercion. Mm -hmm. We've seen an incredible disinformation yeah. campaign in the run-up to January the 13th. Um, but we are also seeing, you know, increase of clashes uh, between uh, China and the Philippines. I mean, this is absolutely a complete erosion of international maritime law in the South China Sea. I would argue, though, putting the, the tensions on the Taiwan Strait aside, we really have to watch North Korea right now, and I think we are missing mm -hmm. that larger point. And this is the this is where those, these conflicts begin to interact. Uh, North Korea providing um, missiles uh, to Russia, Russia increasing its uh, technology mm -hmm. transfer to North Korea, China not playing a constructive role uh, with sanctions and and things like that. That you you really I think you've seen over the last several weeks shifts in. North Korea's posture vis-a-vis -vis South Korea that we have to watch very closely. That is missile capability that can reach the United States. Um, that could be uh, sort of a one of those. Uh, we have we've been watching this for so long. We've ignored it. Like oh, it's you know they keep developing technologies, but I think definitely North Korea is something that's going to be on our watch list on 2020 and okay. 2024. Mm -hmm. Beth, last question before we open up to you. Um, do you share? The, pe the pessimism that Manuel has described. Do you conceive any more constructive way of engaging for the US to engage with China, let's say in the mid longer term? So I would say on the positive side, um, the fact that um, the Taiwanese president does not have a full mandate and that there's a split government has a pro and con. The pro is that he's much, much less likely to be pushing this independence move and the fact that President Biden earlier just after his election said we do not support independence so i think that you know the, uh, the folks who are talking about the risk of war with uh between china and taiwan that the, uh, china invasion of taiwan i think is not that likely in the near term both because 
there's less likely to be a precipitating factor <coughs> and because the Chinese militarily aren't ready to do so. It's an incredibly difficult venture. So I think that, that those kinds of risks I'm, I'm a little bit more calm about. In terms of the overall relationship, I couldn't agree more. These are structural mm -hmm. issues and there's very little to see um, how the relationship would fundamentally change on either side. This is not a US you know, demonizing China problem. This is both sides actually wanting to de-risk and decouple. And if you look at what the Chinese economy is doing, what their aims are in self-sufficiency, it's a mirror image, and it, exa mm -hmm. except that it's more advanced. Uh, they're better at it in some ways, um, but you know, this, these things are happening simultaneously, and the and you know the risks there are actually that it gets worse. I think that this year, in this election year, and in China's year of trying to rebuild and reset um, their economic situation, their outreach to Europe, which is going very well, unfortunately, um, I think actually uh, you know both sides want to keep it fairly calm this year, but the risks that Heather raised. I've been watching the Philippine situation for over, you know, for a year now, and um, they're a treaty ally. Mm -hmm. And we have been very clear about defending them against Chinese aggression. And China has only doubled down on that, and the Philippine side is um, really just trying to stand up for themselves. And this is another case. If people believe, as Zelensky said yesterday, that Ukraine is only about Ukraine and doesn't understand how this has global implications, I think that people really don't understand the linkages between Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And it's not just Russia bilaterally with Iran and North Korea. This is a um, <laughs> configuration that you know I've been talking about for years as a warning, and we're now just seeing it mm -hmm. manifest itself in very concrete ways, and this is just the beginning. So, you know, really at our peril, if we try to separate out China and say, oh, you know, we're just doing economics with China, it doesn't really count, um, well, that doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, our world's connected. Thank you. We're going to really open up now. Um, we have a microphone that's going to come around, please. Clearly, I cannot see very well, so please like, raise your hand, identify. Yes, um, and if, when you speak, please, if you could do me the favor of identifying yourself and being, obviously, as always, short and sweet. So we'll start with Ricardo here in the beginning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for this rich debate. So I'm Ricardo lopez Aranda, ambassador of Spain to Ukraine, and uh, here, especially former fellow at the GMF, so I'm very happy this event is taking place here in Madrid. Uh, I'll try to make it short. A comment and a question. Uh, a comment on what uh, Connolly said about um, letting uh, Russians dictate the terms. I think this, uh, this uh, is in three um, areas. First, in security, in the security guarantees, in membership of NATO. Of course, if, if we allow the Russians to, to say when we can do it, then we uh, deprive ourselves of an important tool. But also in terms of military material, what is escalational, we are basically letting Russians decide what is escalational. And in a third area, which is the economic area, we are, we are not pushing uh, completely because we, we might, uh, we fear that the, the economic disru disruptions that uh, might be created and in, in that way we are playing uh, in the hands of, of the <laughs> Russians, which by the way are in the OPEC and then are able to dictate uh, the terms in which we, we can trade in, in those important issues. And the question, uh, so you mentioned the, um, uh, that uh, the supplemental was about other things than Ukraine, uh, migration, Mexico, but we have to recognize that it's also about Ukraine. Uh, in the, I mean, in the Ukrainian issue, unfortunately, uh, is, uh, runs the risk of uh, becoming partisan in, in the, as the election uh, uh, approaches. So my question is, do you see this fear and uh, how to prevent it from becoming partisan and how to keep it bipartisan? Thank you. Ricardo, thank you so much. Um, again, perception and reality, I feel like that should be the title of this, <laughs> uh, this panel. Um, the reality is there is actually very strong bipartisan support in Congress for Ukraine. It's stronger in the Senate than in the House. Um, the very small but extremely vocal and active House Republicans that are 
anti-Ukraine and pro-Russia, and this is in part, this is where I, I, I lose the ability, God bless you, I, I lose the ability to understand because at this point, if you're anti-Ukraine, you're pro-Russia, pro-China, pro-Iran, and pro-North Korea. So I, like, my Republican friends, so tell me why you're pro-China. Tell me why you're mm -hmm. pro-Iran. Because at this point, this again, absolutely gets to Beth's, what we, what we are failing to understand is this adversarial alignment. They're all supporting one another to make sure we're all collectively defeated. Um, and I, we need to start pressing the inconsistencies of their, of their logic. Um, but I will say there's, there's a couple of things at play for this very, very vocal but small minority of House members. And this again, we, we failed to fully appreciate how Russian influence was penetrating the religious community in, in the United States. This is where sort of the, the bending of the decadence of the West is felt, not only in Mr. Putin's conversation of this, and this has penetrated in some of the evangelical communities. So I, I just, there, there's, a, there's a different, you know, any, any societal division, and certainly, you know, societies are divided in the United States mm -hmm. and in Europe about uh, social uh, issues and, and, and values and traditions and, and, and religion. That has been a, a line that has been definitely a, a weakness that has been found. The other, uh, this is, again, this very gets very much around the former president and his unique views about Mr. Putin and you know that gets into you know I don't want to peel back into history of, of why the former president is, is such a deep admirer of Vladimir Putin um, and again Ukraine has been a constant theme um, of, of his um, but just to say that they fought they are following that mantra but they're very vocal and they're very active and because the the Republicans in the House honestly do not have a majority. They cannot, they cannot overcome this. And so it, it comes down to those domestic politics. If the Ukraine package does get through, which I'm very hopeful, one of the casualties, and this, this will put more pressure on the EU to resolve its own challenges around Hungary and how to fund Ukraine, um, they will probably take out the macroeconomic assistance. <laughs> There's sort of understanding that the military assistance, and again, as the Ukrainians have been very clear to point out, it's buying U.S. weapons. I mean, the money stays in the United States to help Ukraine. So if, if you don't believe in the, the moral value of this, there's an economic value to it. Um, but there is, um, even I think Nikki Haley said this on the campaign trail, that there, there's, they don't want to support the macroeconomic assistance, the salaries and things like that. So if that part mm -hmm. of the package, if it survives and that part comes out, it'll be even more important for the Europeans to continue to provide that. So we're watching it very closely. So I, as I said, I will say there's bipartisan support. This has gotten caught up in the politics and not really addressing that very mm -hmm. small but very vocal and active group. You have, to, you have to challenge people in their concepts. They can hold these ideas, but then, you know, and I just think there's not been enough challenge mm -hmm. to this, um, but because it's a very difficult conversation, many people are willing to in, engage. Mm -hmm. We're gonna batch a few questions together. Uh, Ilke here in the front, I don't know where the microphone is. Um, yeah, here in the front, and then uh, the lady in the middle, and the gentleman right here behind. behind. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is Ilke Teuger. I'm the director of the Applied Research Center at IE University. It's great to have you all here. Uh, my question goes on the Global South, actually, because for me, assuming that China is shaping entirely the public opinion and the elite strategies in these countries is denying their agency, and in a group of countries that are very different and, 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 and actually a large group of world's population, so for me, it's a very important question and it's a high time that we address this in the Transatlantic Alliance that what is the right approach and strategy uh, for these countries and building a more inclusive multilateralism and as Heather said, not forgetting for the next 75. Because if there is not a strategy out there, which is an inclusive one, recognizing their agency, then there will be of course other actors in the world, but. I was wondering if our speakers have opinions on a more constructive transatlantic strategy on that. Thank you. Thank you. The lady in the middle here, please. I don't know if there's any. <laughs> so 
Alberto. My question is on China. I am Can Sylvia, you identify yourself, please, if you don't mind? Silvia Iranzo, um, ex-State Secretary for Trade and ex-Ambassador. And right now I'm at the think tank in Tipe for international matters. Um, my question is a little bit blunt. So um, I'm thinking one of the stated big items on the agenda of Mr. Xi Jinping when he announced his five-year plan um, one year back, um, he said that he wished to take over Taiwan, and he's never shied away from saying that. And given that, given that, well, there's a conflict in Ukraine, and it has concentrated lots of resources from Europe and from the U.S., and then later on we see Gaza, which is also concentrating lots of firepower, both at the Red Sea and um, at the Mediterranean. Um, if uh, you were Xi Jinping, maybe you would be thinking, so now is the right time to strike, given that so much power is being diverted elsewhere. What do you think about that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, a gentleman two rows behind. Hi, Mira. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you for the event and all the interesting interventions. Uh, my name is Guillermo Barran from the Master of Intelligence, Economic and Geopolitics from the University of Autónoma de Madrid. Uh, my question regards to the statistics we saw in the, in the beginning. Um, how could democratic structures strengthen uh, people's and more precisely young people's uh, confidence in cooperation projects such as NATO? Thank you. Yeah. Great, so we have one question on multilateralism. Is China gonna take advantage uh, of our questions. weakness and strike, and the question on um, transatlanticization, on the youth gap. Um, any takers? Martin, also, maybe you want to take uh, one of the questions on transatlantic trends? I, I'm happy to pitch in very quickly. Three great questions. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. I, I think we can begin, uh, and I challenge all of us, we can't bunch all these countries into global south. Yes. As you're talking about a nuanced diplomatic and economic and security strategy, why in the world are they clumped? And we treat them like they're not getting the message. It's not a message thing. It is a diplomatic, economic, and security strategy that is tailored to them. And I would argue this is a great transatlantic project mm -hmm. because for some of these countries, the US may have a better way into the conversation. For others, the US will be the last person to, mm -hmm. last actor. Uh, European colleagues mm -hmm. may have better things. We need to develop a nuanced approach here where again, we're clear what, what are our priorities, we're listening to what their priorities are, and we're finding those intersections. And there may be quite a few, there may be very few, but to find them and to build on a diplomatic um, uh, strategy. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more, um, but this again requires new diplomatic, new economic tools, and um, you know, I, we're excited to, to start that. Clearly on, on, on China, look, I think, we uh, never can forget the power of a, a, a leader who believes that they have historical significance mm -hmm. at this moment. This is Vladimir Putin's own sense of historical correction. I think there is very much to Xi Jinping. And so I, have, I think we have to stay absolutely alert to this, take their words for granted. Mr. Putin has told us what he is going to be doing. We just said, oh no, he won't do that. Mm -hmm. His domestic, does that ring any bells? His domestic economy, this would be ridiculous. It would backfire. Yes, that would be true. And he still uh, did it. I think what we just need to make sure is that we don't, and there's some in the US, particularly in the military community, what you don't want to do is hyperventilate uh, when this could be. Um, again, the projection of confidence and clarity of, of what the international community's strong response would be if there is forcible uh, reunification. And then NATO, young people, favorite, favorite topic in the world. I think we need to do something with, with all respect. You know, we have youth summits and things like that. Uh, that's, not, that's not what we need. Um, we really need to have very focused conversations with, with, um, with community, young people in communities, what does security mean to them? Because it means climate security, it means human security, it means economic security. How does NATO play into that? Let's have that conversation. It really begins with, a, I think, mm -hmm. a fundamental new conversation with young people so they, cannot, they can understand what it means that NATO 
is more about making sure peace is there than war, but you have to describe it like that. You have to talk about how it w resolves. And then community military leaders can talk to young people as well that we're all, they're part of NATO, that's our community, protecting our community, protecting the community of values. So I think it's a lot of innovation in that thought process. So my two cents. Something quickly on, on the China question. Um, so I think we're very, f I think we're far from an outright, like Beth was saying, an outright invasion uh, of the island. Most of the analysis I've read and when you speak to colleagues that know about this, um, that seems very costly and the probability of actually uh, that not being feasible for the PLA to execute is not small. Um, the scenario of the blockade has also been discussed and there was a sort of like a mock blockade after the Nancy Pelosi uh, visit to Taiwan. I think if that was to be implemented in a much more uh, long-term fashion, it'd be very difficult for the Chinese to sustain. I mean, we've, we've seen blockades in the past of easier places to blockade than Taiwan, and they tend to be very costly diplomatically, uh, economically, and they, they're very costly tactically to sustain. Uh, so I think as long as the politics on both sides do not favor clearly uh, reunification, I think there's, there's some durability to the status quo. I think what China is doing now is uh, they're getting ready for a scenario of much more open conflict with the U.S. and its allies and, and the West. And it's very hard to explain uh, the current Chinese economic policy if you don't look at it through a lens of them accelerating their decoupling process mm -hmm. from the West. Mm -hmm. So it is very evident, very evident, that the policies that they're implementing on talent, on certain economic sectors, on trade with others, including, by the way, the COVID policies, which were very hard to explain in the latest phase from a public health perspective. Uh, my hunch and the folks that I, I engage with when I'm there and people that follow the China question deeply mm -hmm. is that this is an attempt to accelerate the decoupling and to test the Chinese ability to depend much less from external demand, uh, from external talent, and to some extent that's what they're doing. Uh, they're really accelerating, uh, diminishing their dependence from the outside world with huge cost uh, for the Chinese economy, by the way. Mm -hmm. Their growth is slowing down. There's a huge sense of uncertainty when you go to China and you speak to folks there. Uh, the level of savings, domestic and otherwise, is way higher than you would have expected. Level of investment is much lower than you would have expected. So there are clear signs in the economy that this is creating mm -hmm. both concerns internally but also constraints to, uh, to growth. In fact, you get this clear sense that the country is facing this fork in the road. And it's not a small fork. I mean, it's a major decision that the country seems to be needing, which is are they going to recommit to the opening strategy and the Deng Xiaoping strategy, which commits them to interdependence, which I think now collides with their strategic vision mm -hmm. of vulnerability. And they've seen in the Russian case how that interdependence can be weaponized and how that can be a source of vulnerability. Or they follow this other path, which is a path of closing and of m much greater a detachment from international markets and others. And you know, there are statements to both effects. There are policies that seem to tilt much more towards the latter, which is we're going to uh, you know, put pressure on the economy to decouple very quickly from the outside world, uh, despite the, the cost. It depends on who you talk to uh, in China. Most people are so accustomed, it's a bit like the US engagement with the world. No? They've been on this path of openness for many decades that has been so successful that they cannot even think that this is being left behind. But if you look at the policies, it really looks like China has taken a turn. And in my mind, the explanation is clearly not economic. Nope. Clearly National not economic. Security. It's, a, it's mm. a security decision that is getting them ready and gearing for a much tougher uh, geopolitical environment. But this, this is all to say that because this process is ongoing and the other factors around the difficulty of, a, of action in, in against Taiwan, direct action, I think that this is for the future. It's not in the short term, I think, something that we will, uh, that, that we will see, uh, direct conflict, because there, there are all of these elements of preparation, I think, that are, that are being uh, deployed. I'm not going to add too much to that on China, except to say that um, we shouldn't be confused that they can kind of do both at the same time for some time. I mean, part of their effort is to capture 
markets and to control export markets. That is not different than, that is not mutually exclusive from isolating their vulnerabilities for their import side, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want to decouple from the export. They want to control the EV market. They want to control the solar market. And they will um, undercut all Western companies that are dumb enough to give them the uh, intellectual <coughs> property, they will take it over and um, they will steal and they will do whatever it takes to control those global markets. So, you know, we shouldn't be confused by that because that's part of the plan. Um, I like this idea on the global south and I, I think that Heather's point about not glumping <laughs> the entire half of the world into one bucket is so important and I think that the lack of nuance in our discourse over this really is at our peril. And this idea of the United States not having to lead every single narrative and point globally is so important. And, and I think that President Biden actually um, in the G20 meeting that India held was for the first time I think really articulating this vision that um, about the agency of other countries. I think that Spain has a really unique role to play in Latin America and in some ways, you know, has been much more consistent in the engagement with Latin America than unfortunately my own country, sadly, sadly, sadly. Um, Brazil is now the new G20 um, uh, leader and I think that, you know, Having a constructive conversation, I think, you know, what I would ask of members of this very important middle power is that maybe spending less time trying to tear down um, the United States, but to really talk about what is the positive vision mm -hmm. in these global institutions that they would like to see and working with us to get there because you get a lot of conversation about how the institutions are terrible and they're unbalanced. They are unbalanced. We created them that way on purpose. And it's worked pretty well for the most of the world for a long time. Um, but, you know, I, I really very rarely hear the positive vision versus the negative vision that I hear China and Russia putting out there. And let's just say, the reason that the UNSC Security Council isn't working right now isn't because of the United States. It's because mm -hmm. Russia and China veto everything um, or put blocks on things that the rest of the world, other than Israel, I'll be honest, um, you know, want to put forward. So let's, I think, maybe have a more um, honest conversation about how this world can move forward and how we can work together on that. That would be my, my request. Um, my last little positive thing on youth. Um, the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, the nonprofit part of that, is, has begun this, um, this initiative called the Civic Bee. So I don't know if people are familiar with the spelling bee, but it's this idea that there's this competition among youth to be great spellers. And there are, in communities all over the United States, children show up and are challenged to spell. Well, uh, so this new initiative is to challenge the youth to understand our Constitution, to understand our institutions, and to understand how important they are to our country and to our future. And I would say that wouldn't it be great if in a transatlantic aspect that we could really focus <coughs> on um, our shared institutions, but also our national, individual national institutions that we're all proud of. And, you know, and Spain has a lot to be proud of in, um, in a very short amount of time to develop institutions. And, and I don't know if Spaniards are like Americans in youth, not really understanding and embracing that. But I do think that there are lots of things that we can do that are these kind of small initiatives that could have um, really outsized influence. Thank you, Beth. We have a little final couple of interventions that we're going to take real quick. Uh, well, three, okay. Uh, since you're all sitting beside Andres Ortega starting. Andres, can you wave so you can recognize him? I'm an independent writer and I'm 
glad to see so many friends in, on stage. Two, short, two very short questions. Uh, do we have the US and the EU and the Europeans the, industrial, the military industrial capacity to sustain Ukraine long enough and to wage or to be implicated in a war now in the Middle East? Uh, because I think I, I, I want to hear your, uh, your answer, not mine. Uh, and on sanctions and decoupling, in the, in the, in the line that um, uh, Manuel was saying, uh, I don't think we have been smart, smart enough. Uh, we have provoked an industrialization of Russia. Russia economy is doing fairly well. Not and we have accelerated the, 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 the industrialization of Russia. And in China also, I think we, we are accelerating the, 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 the technological development of China. Instead of being in it interdependent, now they are going to build their own AI issues uh, and chips and all that. Maybe before it was 10 years, now they're going to take five years. Thank you. Just, behind, just pass the mic behind you. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gerald Stang with Global Affairs Canada. And a uh, quick question, about, I guess, about uh, tying a few themes uh, together here. I really appreciated the last comment about the Global South and uh, the US not leading everything and empowering the agency of others. Um, but one theme running through uh, this discussion, and I guess the work of the GMF, obviously, in Casa America, is America's role in the world. And a lot of the discussion has been about more, uh, the capacity to escalate when they need to, to do reach out more to Latin America, to, to do more for Ukraine, more, more, more. But to some extent, I would suggest that some of the difficulties and the pushback and the ne negativity are experienced because of the dominant role of the US people are always going to be some people are going to be resentful of the dominant powers. So uh, different voices have uh, in, in the survey discussed here. So youth, uh, Republicans, uh, and per perhaps the states in the global south of various types uh, are, would be less positive about the, the exercise of American power in different ways. Now, as, as a Canadian, obviously, I'm uh, pretty happy with a lot of, a lot of what, perhaps not all, uh, of what the US does in the world, but is, in a discussion like this, can you envision benefits from uh, some retrenchment, not isolation, but is there a way that the US can certainly play in a role in the world with not, o with not always committing more, doing more, being elsewhere? Thanks. Great question. Final question from the gentleman just behind you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Gil von Santa from the the School of Economic Intelligence and International Relations uh, from the University of Autonoma of Madrid. Um, my question, uh, regarding the same as Mr. Manuel that told us that, as him, I see um, the European Union or Europe as the most important of these challenges, future challenges, my double question is related. Uh, first, what's about uh, the upcoming elections in Europe the Parliament of Europe, and uh, in some relation, what's about those uh, dangerous ideas, for example, regarding the proposal by South Africa in the UNO uh, about uh, Israel, that in my point of view is a kind of trying to divide the Western allies. So thank you. Thank you. Staccato round, pick up any of the questions that you would like, but please, we are a little short, so um, maybe I'll start with you, we'll Heather. Uh, Andre, it's great to see you, my gosh. Um, you just put your finger right on it. it it's, um, it's our lack of military industrial production in the United States and in Europe. So we hope to get uh, Ukraine the 155 millimeter ammunition it needs by 2025. What does that mean by you know 2024? Um, and now that the demands, not only in the Middle East, uh, I can only speak uh, to the US, we don't have the labor, the production lines, the, uh, it is a massive challenge to, to 
to meet the needs just of Ukraine today, regardless of helping uh, Israel, uh, Taiwan, uh, and other US allies. Uh, it's a huge issue. So Vladimir Putin also has agency, and he has decided to put all of his economic potential into war production. Um, and, and so you're, you're absolutely right. We have now have this, this shift where we are scrambling to find European ammunition capabilities, artillery, the US is scrambling. He is able to produce, but also because of Iran and North Korea, is able to continue um, to, to do that. He is making a choice about the future of the Russian economy that in some ways the Chinese are making some very uh, important decisions about the future of their economy. I think Vladimir Putin, uh, again, uh, th there's parallels here. The demographic collapse uh, that we're seeing in China, obviously this, these figures that came out today, Russia is in the same absolutely Worse. catastrophic between COVID and now mobilization and things like that. They're making choices about their future um, and d future direction. And I think what you're starting to see, a conversation of another GMF seminar perhaps, we are, we don't want to admit this because it's not what we want. We're seeing an emergent two block system. This yep. is dual circulation. This is Iran, North Korea, uh, eventually I think uh, China and Russia. This is the axis of sanctioned countries. They have learned how to, to avoid those sanctions. We see these ghost shipments, they're refining uh, their other product. That's, I think, what we're not dealing with head on. Um, and as it, it's hard to see what changes that unless there's a, a massive um, change uh, in, in leadership. Um, and just one final word, and this is not a, a great example, but uh, you never fully appreciate something until it is, it is gone, until it recedes. We can talk about it, but until it's gone. And I, I think our, our British colleagues have had an example of that through Brexit. You don't appreciate it yep. until you leave it. Now, there are benefits to departure. There you know, things, you have to do things, you do things differently, but there are great costs. And, and so you think about that, you know, what can the US do less? So I'll use the Red Sea example. Mm -hmm. The US cannot keep carriers and frigates in the Mediterranean. It is needed for the Indo-Pacific. It is needed to do something more in the North Atlantic to protect from Russian uh, vessels. Okay, we can't do that. France, you will have to send your uh, maritime fleet to do this because it impacts Europe or Spain. You will have to move. You will have to step that. That is the decision moment when countries have to go, ah, ah, wait, uh, I need to do this? I, I, Wow, that will be the step up moment on the military capabilities. Um, you know, I, I don't want the US to shrink. Uh, I want the US and its allies to do more. The, de the world is demanding us to do more, uh, not less. But that's where, you know, it, it, it's stepping up and stepping forward and stepping in. It's difficult, it takes risks. You will, the leader will be criticized. That doesn't feel good. Um, the, you will take risks, you have to manage public support. It's not easy stepping in uh, to this. But you're right, the only way you can really step in is if the US steps out a bit. The US has always had a very difficult time. It has, I, I always argued, has two leadership modes. Either we're in charge of it and we're telling you what to do, or you've got this, we've gotta be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The best part is when we together say, you'll do this, I'll do that, we'll be supportive. I'm not leaving, but I'm not gonna play the central wall role. Europe or Canada will have to play that central role. We have to play a backstopping role. We're gonna play the central role here. And then we have trust and confidence that we will be there. That trust and confidence isn't there from the US. You're not mm -hmm. sure what our election will bring, but it does require a new type of leadership for a very fluid world. We're not there yet, uh, but it, it really requires both. But mm -hmm. I don't want us to withdraw, but I think that would be the one instance where everyone will have a lesson appreciation of how much they rely on it and then what they have to do to step forward if it's not there and they believe it's important for their own national security interests to pursue it. On this, um, <laughs> just a reaction to your comment on the two blocks, no? this world moving to a two I hope that's not true, by the way. I no, 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 hope I mean, not. It, it seems that it uh, is. moving in that direction, <laughs> but that, that will make uh, the Global South very important, right? Mm -hmm. because
Yeah, I would argue died. we are yeah. already fact, at that. The battery fact, died. Yeah. In <laughs> fact, a, lord, a large number of countries will try to avoid of alignment. Of so, of so a, a lot of the big policy issues will be decided by our ability to engage with the Global South uh, effectively. No? So I think that that's, that's important. On, on U.S. retrenchment and something positive about it, I mean, I, I, th there might be one thing, if it's done in an orderly way, and if it's not just sheer retrenchment, maybe rebalancing or distribution of functions, is that it might in fact wake up Europe uh, from a security point of view. So free riding on security is a, is a rational policy choice, right? So you, you know, why wouldn't you do it? If you can do it, then you spend money on something else. And when you look at European defense spending and European defense capabilities in particular, it is very clear that there's been a lot of free riding on the US, on intelligence, on airlift, you know, on projection capacity, I mean, a whole range of things uh, that have popped up in various conflicts, in the Balkans, in Libya, now, of course, on the Ukrainian front, you know. So, and, 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 and the Europeans, I mean, I, I don't know how um, self-serving or not this is, you know, coming from a European, but the truth is, unless there's a concerted strategy where the U.S. is committed to taking part of that, you know, reducing part of that uh, overbearance on the European scenario, uh, we will continue to free ride, right? So, so there's, there is some benefit uh, to this occurring. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a committed transatlanticist, so I, I don't want the U.S. to leave Europe in any way, but maybe the Trump presidency was the most effective in getting Europeans really jolted and realizing that the U.S. might leave. And, and this was not the first presidency to indicate that there was a, a burden sharing issue. It was the first to be very aggressive at saying we might not be there, we might in fact leave, right? We might in fact not comply with Article 5 commitments. So, so just asking for this is, is not enough. So maybe there has to be some other way. So, you know, but if you, if you overdo it, if you do it too quickly, you might actually uh, see real failure on security issues in the, f in the borders of Europe on something that might be very costly uh, for Europeans. Um, but, you know, I, I did part of my doctoral work on this, so it's a very risky question because I can be, you know, talk, talk about this for three hours. But in, in fact, when we speak of European integration, it's a very fancy word, but European integration is a fancy way of saying giving up sovereignty uh, to the EU. Why would you give up your sovereignty and security issues, both on procurement, capability development, and on decisions, unless there's a real cost that you're going to face if you don't? And as long as the U.S. is there to take out that cost, nobody's going to move forward on the integration dossier. So, you know, maybe there's a benefit <laughs> to the U.S. Um, I might regret having said this, you know, <laughs> a few years from now when we need to start paying the bill that this uh, entails. But I think that that might be. Um, that that might be positive. A final, a very final comment sorry, uh, on um, on the on the sanctions uh, piece. So there's a there's a very uh, extensive literature on this. So sanctions are very bad at changing behavior in the short term. We know this; they very rarely do, but they do set countries on very different developmental paths depending on how the sanctions are built. I'm very very um, skeptic uh, skeptical about this argument that we have now fast-tracked the Chinese semi semiconductor industry or whatever the Russians are doing on their end on the industrial side. Uh, I think that there has been a real process of tech transfer and IP transfer to China and to others that has come from the entanglement that we have had with them and that it has helped them converge technologically with the most advanced economies. And I think the sanctions in the long term will hurt uh, the Russian economy and the Chinese mm -hmm. economy and their output potential and their sophistication. So, and, and uh, again, and there is quite a bit of evidence that in fact sanctions, if they're broad and sustained over time, they tend to do that. So like Heather was saying, I think that these countries have made decisions uh, based on their foreign policy and the reaction that they have elicited from us that put them on a very different developmental path, a, a worse one uh, in, both, in both cases. Is this, I don't, I think I'm, f I'm good. Um, I think on this, idea that Trump, um, you know, made headway in terms of getting the Europeans to start to wake up. Yes and no. I think really that President Putin did that. And that was the big sea change um, for, for very practical things as well as for the numbers we saw on um, Martin's presentation. 
So I think that if there is a Trump presidency, it's going to be actually a second Trump presidency that will create what both um, you and Heather talked about because um, I think that there will be actually quite a bit of withdrawal. So, you know, I think we can thank President Putin for restarting our industrial, our military industrial complex in a way that was not going to happen without this war. And now we need to look ahead and continue it um, to a point where we can actually take on these um, multiple global challenges that are not going to go away. Uh, Heather mentioned North Korea. This is something that if it doesn't happen soon, it's going to happen in the next um, you know, five to 10 years. It is a real thing, it is not going away. And um, we certainly don't want a two front um, situation in Asia that we have to deal with. I think that Russia, uh, this idea of industrialization of Russia, I would agree completely with you, uh, Manuel, that it's not um, serious. It's a military uh, industrialization and it cannot be sustained. And their overall industrial base is crap and it's not going to get better and they have no, no people to put into the factories. Um, so, I mean, they've just killed off, you know, half a million people probably by the end of this are not going to be fit for, for service in factories. Um, so I think that that's very bad. On a positive note to end, my, my last point here is about, um, to the point, this Canadian idea of, you know, how can the United States um, be constructive and work with others? I'll look again to Latin America and uh, as a place where maybe this can happen. Um, when Venezuela began to threaten Guyana and Brazil moved troops to the border and said, mm, not so fast. I think, um, and the UK sent a ship, uh, a destroyer to be off the coast. And the United States is present too. I think that there are ways that we can and we should work collaboratively. Um, not that that was all that collaborative in some ways, but it could be. And, and I, I look at Guatemala as being another place where we absolutely have to collaborate to support that democratic movement there against the corrupt forces. And let's look at Ecuador, where it is the drug demand, um, not just in the United States, but really in Ecuador, this is about the European demand for cocaine um, and the drug cartels that are based very much in Europe um, as well as the rest of Latin America that is driving this instability. What can we do collaboratively to think about that? So I think that there's quite a bit of space. Maybe it's not in the big, huge um, crises that are, that are really dominating us, but we have so many other things that are undermining our prosperity, our ability to be um, you know, democratic and, prosper and prosperous. And so we could really focus um, a lot together on those challenges. Thank you, Beth. And all I'm going to offer in terms of summary is, may you live in interesting times. And friends, this is uh, time for some thank yous. So let me start by thanking our fantastic panelists, Beth, Manuel, Heather, thank you so much. Thanks goes also, of course, to our to our partners who made this possible. So thank you very much to Casa de America, Enrique, Elena, I don't know where you are, um, um, for, for making this possible, for giving us this fantastic space. Thank you also to the US Embassy in Madrid for your support. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks goes also to BBWA Foundation for supporting Transatlantic Trends, after all. Um, thank you also, of course, to my Dear colleagues who organized this, whom I'd really like to emphasize, Hermine, Martina, uh, uh, Pedro, thank you so much. And last but not least, a big thank you to all of you for bearing with us until the last moment. Thank you so much. Thank you. And have a good day. Give me that.